95's Johnny Mnemonic review and thoughts film. Nope, not the game, hadn't played it. Doesn't look like I'm missing much, and not the short story, though I listened through the audiobook as research. I don't remember the date, but not very long ago. I'm not a literary critic. Don't expect me to. I, th I think I did once review, like one book maybe, but it is really not my. I, I don't have the uh, background, I guess, is the. And me doing this video is not me hinting that I'll be doing a review of Cyberpunk 2077. It looks cool. I don't have a copy right now. I guess it's possible I'll get it when it's extremely inexpensive. That's pretty much the only way I ever buy games. Don't hold your breath. I very rarely do RPGs. And... Now, I re-watched the original Matrix, not the sequels, a few days ago to compare since that one gets a lot of cyberpunk stuff right. Now, I'm not saying that this movie is bad because it's not as good. I'll get more into that. I realize this video is long. If you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is fairly, comparatively short. And if you want to know how short, you know, check the... The, the time codes in the description box will let you know when it ends. And I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, whether it's this or anything else, I'll warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler so you can mute and skip ahead. And when you see me lower my index finger, that means I'm done spoiling. And as soon as I end the spoiler-free review itself, Please note, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. And, let's see. Now, I base my... Everything I say in this video, I base... Never mind. The review itself, I base on the theatrical cut. Have not watched the Japanese cut. Sounds like it's better. I haven't watched it firsthand. I might bring up. I've I've seen some clips from it, so I might compare some. But I don't know what the overall experience of watching it is. And and before you say yes, I am aware that having watched a few clips, not the same thing as having watched the movie because among other things, they have different music in the Japanese cut. So watching the movie overall is legitimately a different experience from watching the theatrical cut. And let's see. I've watched this at least once before. I forget if I've watched it anytime. You know, I watched it just, you know, minutes ago. I finished watching it minutes ago so that it would be fresh in my mind for this video. And I know I've watched it at least once before. I am not 100% certain if I've watched it more than those two times. I think at, at the very most, I might have watched it as much as six times total by now. So, the plot. Johnny Mnemonic, also, you know, he, he basically goes by Johnny Smith. Mnemonic is basically his job title, I think. It's, you know, yeah is a courier. He transports data implanted in his brain and he's going on what may be a dangerous job. I mean, he will technically have to go to Jersey. And he suddenly finds himself hunted by people who want the data and they don't look like they're going to let him live afterwards. So he has to figure out what the data is, why people want it, and how he's going to survive this thing. So if this is something you've never heard of, you know, briefly, it's an action drama sci-fi movie. It was released in 1995, directed by painter and music video director Robert Longo. I forget, has he directed anything movie-wise before since? I think he maybe directed, like, at least one episode of TV, Joe, but yeah, he... not 
he does not usually direct movies and it kind of shows and maybe it's not such a bad thing that he hasn't directed a movie since this and apparently he himself wasn't even happy with how it came out so you know and it was basically trying to bring a cyberpunk vision of the future to the movie theater you know there there were quite a few you know written stories novels short stories but you know there's a lot of money in movies and so yeah and i know that this is not the first cyberpunk but it i, th I haven't watched all of them i think it might be the first william gibson cyberpunk and his is a very distinct style you know they had already done movies based uh, you know cyberpunk based on cyberpunk movie adaptations based on Philip K. Dick stories and he also did some great cyberpunk writing you know you will you will never hear me I have almost nothing negative to say about Philip K. Dick and his writing now let's see I also want to really underline I realize a number of people think very little of this movie and honestly I have a number of issues with it as well but this is the kind of thing that I could enjoy it's it's not that I'm so disappointed that I'm gonna you know tear it apart but I I feel that the best way to get great art is by being very honest about what is good and what isn't good so that you know when when you point to something that people made and say here's how it could be better then in the future hopefully we will get something better i do empathize with it it's very frustrating i've been there myself working very hard on something showing it to people and having people be well this wasn't as good as it could be that sucks you know but I, I do reviews, so I am going to, but I'm not trying to just destroy the movie. Now, this movie is set in the then 26 years away, now just a week away, January 17th, 2021. I'm not going to lie, if somehow I wake up on January 17th and the real world looks like this movie's vision of the real world I will be at least a little bit surprised now you might be thinking that when I decided when I was going to do a video on this I realized that it might be fun if I got it out just in time before the day that its events start you would be wrong it was completely by luck and sadly the movie is not breathtaking and it definitely is not all breathtaking seriously though hearing Keanu say that really underlined just how nice of a guy he is in real life I will be arguing against some of the criticisms that other people have laid out against it where I feel that they are unfair but it's the movie th this video will not be all apologism or apologist in nature apparently apologism isn't quite a word yet I'm trying to make it a thing I read someone say that William Gibson, who wrote both the original short story and the script, although he says that they didn't use his final script, which I think there's some credibility to, himself didn't really understand technology when he wrote these stories, and that's why the details sound so silly, even within years of him writing them. And I think there's a chance, and I can see an argument, you know, I, th I think there's a chance that that's true. I wasn't able to c c confirm or... Did I? reject but I can definitely see an argument against him writing so much if he didn't know more detail you know he wrote I want to say at least six whole novels about you know of, of cyberpunk fiction you know and yeah if he didn't know more detail than he apparently did but he did do a great job writing other than those details you know the the sense of the world the, this kind of neo-noir thing he really nails it. It's, you know, I recommend you read his, his work. You know, maybe start with a short story if, to see if you like his style. 
the Johnny Mnemonic short story itself is really, really good and fairly representative. I must admit, it's been some years. I read the entire Sprawl trilogy and I read Virtual Light. I have not read the rest of the, I want to say it's called the Bridge trilogy, but I absolutely love it. And yeah, he's, you know, the, the, some of these characters I remember many years later, you know, so yeah, the, the, um, but, but yeah, you know, it's, it's definitely not for everyone, the, the way he writes. But the neo-noir aspect, he really nails. It, it really feels like, yeah, you know, noir, but with technology. And yeah, but you know, I could definitely understand someone not liking his work or adaptations of it based on the bad tech understanding. And... There's definitely, there are some things in there where it's like, e even when he wrote it, like people with, you know, who, who knew computers were wondering what on earth, where, where did he get some of this stuff? This, it's, it's not the fact that it didn't exist at the time. That's part of the point of him writing it is trying to give an idea of what might be in the future. It's that it didn't make sense. You know, it, it's the kind of thing that, you wouldn't get, like, it's not quite, like, sci-fi written in the 50s and 60s bad at telling what the future was going to hold in tech, but it still, it had some very fundamental misunderstandings of how technology work and what's at all reasonable to expect that they could do. And, you know, it, it's the kind of thing where either you kind of try to push the push that out of your head while you're reading or listening to the audiobook or it turns you off to his work you know or you know if if you don't know more than he did when he wrote them he's not dead you know then that's also that that solves it right there if you're choosing between either audiobook or book I would maybe suggest a book because sometimes there will be like a burst of slang and you may want to just like, like, like take, just take a brief break from reading and be like, okay, based on the context, what does that mean? And maybe like go back a page or something, you know, maybe it was, maybe they're using slang to talk about something that you've already been introduced to, but they didn't use that slang term about it before. So if you could just go back a page and be like, oh, that's what, that's what that means. Okay. And then you can keep reading, which would obviously be more difficult if you're listening to an audio book. So, yeah. Now, the writing. The, the, um, yeah, I'm, some of this is going to be verbatim from Wikipedia. Much of cyberpunk is rooted in new wave sci-fi in the new wave sci-fi, the new wave sci-fi movement of the 60s and 70s by Philip K. Dick. And quick interjection, I've read everything by him that I've been able to get my hands on. Roger Zelazny, John Brunner, J. G. Ballard, Philip Jose Farmer. I'm sorry, I I haven't read anything by the or if I have, I don't remember that it was that I, I maybe didn't realize at the time that it was them. And Harlan Ellison. Love what I read about him. Not to mention the episodes of, I want to say Outer Limits, but possibly Twilight Zone that he wrote. Demon with a Glass Hand and Soldier. And, uh, you know, yes, I assure you, I would love those two, especially Demon with a Glass Hand, even if they hadn't served so clearly as the inspiration, not the only inspiration, but a, a substantial chunk of the inspiration for The Terminator, which is one of my all-time favorite movies. And, yeah, William Gibson's novels and short stories helped solidify and define cyberpunk. And, yeah, that was it for the Wikipedia stuff. Now, for those who haven't read cyberpunk, you know, if you want the pure William Gibson experience, think System Shock 1 and 2, Deus Ex 1 through 4. 
And I, you know, a couple of other cyberpunk games that I've played are Beneath a Steel Sky. Yes, I am excited for the sequel. Yes, I'm aware it's already out. Like I said, I'm waiting for a great deal on it. Oni, Soma, I love all these games, except maybe System Shock 1 and definitely Deus Ex 2. And I own but haven't yet played Deus Ex 4, but I know enough about it to confirm it is definitely very William Gibson cyberpunk. But yeah. Neo noir and often with sci-fi that isn't hugely advanced from what we have when it's written. And these worlds are full of people who have had parts of their body augmented, sometimes even replaced with mechanical and electronic stuff. You know, if someone is a bodyguard or a mother, maybe they will have their muscles or entire arms replaced with robot ones. If someone works at night, maybe they'll have something installed in their brain that allows natural night vision. You know, in the short story, Molly, who here is Jane, has retractable razor blades under her fingernails, which right there gives you a pretty good idea of how, you know, that's, you know, you, you don't have to worry about, like, getting out a knife and, you know, yeah, retractable razor blade, finger, you know, under her fingernails would be extremely useful in the, the bodyguard, yeah. And, you know, sadly, this movie does not have razor blade fingernails. But they did at least fit in the thumb fiber wire from the short story. And I guess, yeah, just to briefly explain, basically, there's a person who's, like, the, the top of his thumb just comes off. And, like, there's this, yeah, yeah fiber wire. And it's so extremely thin that it, he can use it as basically a whip and cut through things, including steel. And again, you know, if like hypothetically, if he had, if he was running around with a knife, if he has to go into a place, maybe someone pats him down, and they're like, "You're not going in here with that with that knife." Just you know, and. If, you know, obviously some people in this universe know about the, the thumb fiber wire, but a lot of people wouldn't, so. I saw at least one review say that it was, you know, it's not a good idea for a weapon. Let me briefly explain why it smarts in addition to you, to, you know, it smarts. You know, in addition to, you don't have to worry about someone confiscating a weapon, spotting you carrying a weapon, realizing that you're dangerous. You know, no one can tell that it's dangerous at all, and even if they do realize that you're dangerous, they won't know how you attack before it's already too late. Basically, William Gibson envisioned a world in which regular people would find everyday uses for technology that was originally developed as luxuries for rich people which is a very credible version of the future. Basically, he figured that incredible technology would not be the great equalizer that many optimistic sci-fi writers believed. You know, this, I, I saw at least one other person point out, this is not Star Trek. You know, this is not the post-scarcity, post-capitalism world where there are no more conflicts and the only way we can get conflict is to go out into space and seek out the conflict, you know, no, this is still, you know, basically, things wouldn't really change all that much. More technology and computers would, you know, sure, but a lot of them would be involved in small-time crime. There wouldn't necessarily be less small-time crime, there might be more. You know, a lot of regular people would still be forced to turn to risky work, some even crime, to get by, and yeah, it's just, it feels like a very credible version of the future, you know, the, the, I want to say that he started, the, the first of his writings came out in the 80s, I believe the short story itself is from 84. Yeah, you know, let's, let's go with, you know, 84. Well, it's been... 37 years? We have a lot more technology now than we did in the 80s, but in a number of ways, for example, America actually is worse off. You know, you wouldn't, like, again, if you if you listen to, I'm, I'm 
I want to briefly say I am not trying to diss Star Trek. I think Star Trek has some incredible stories, and I I absolutely love Deep Space Nine and a lot of Voyager. And, you know, I'm not sure I should talk too much about it. I respect the original series and The Next Generation. I, I actually, I also quite like the animated series. And Star Trek Enterprise certainly does exist. And I have not watched New Trek yet. I might at some point. But yeah, the you know if you if you listen to stuff like Star Trek, which again you know back in the sixties, yeah, some people thought that the future would be an incredible place, and I realize that we haven't reached the future. You know, I, I forget what was it like twenty two fifties or something that Star Trek takes place. You know, so they weren't saying that we would be there yet, but they were saying that the future would be a better place in part because of technology. And that just has not happened. You know, we have incredible technology, but a lot of it is just, like, convenience for regular people. And they make rich people even more rich and powerful, but they don't actually mean that everybody has great opportunities. Excuse me. And I do want to say that the movie actually does a decent job of fitting a lot of this stuff in. And you have body modifications. It's, it's specifically called out several times that some of the characters have had their bodies modified and were told some of the effects that it has it's, you know, it's had on them. Some of them are stronger than normal humans. Some of them are faster you know, to the point where they, to a certain extent, can dodge bullets. And they do have to. But the... I mean, it's really mostly the fact that it's somewhat superficial here. It's not as... the, the depth that is in the... I mean, even the short story, there's some real, like... I'm not 100% certain how long of a movie it would be if you literally translated it. Maybe 40 minutes. And yeah, there's there's some real depth there, which... I mean, honestly, some of, some of the way the depth is... Excuse me. It's present. Excuse me. In this movie, but it's... It's a little harder to spot because of all the kind of shallow elements in in a lot of ways it is very typical action 90s 90s action movie there we go i knew there was the right order for those words to go in you know i i have to admit i not remembering how much they fit in i was preparing to say you know, I understand why they didn't put all that much of this kind of stuff in the movie, because it's something that requires a lot of explaining and suspension of disbelief. But going to this movie is kind of like paying for ice cream and instead getting ice cubes, which, you know, technically it sort of is in the general direction of what you wanted. You were promised, but it's bland, boring, and lacking in flavor. And really, that's not super the case with this. And, yeah, you know, I'm glad. Now, the, let's see, it is a little bit of a problem that the, in a, in a, in a written story, whether it's a short story or a novel, the, the reader doesn't mind, it's kind of expected, basically, that Okay, to be fair, there are stories that there are, I've read written stories that don't do this, but in a number of written stories, you just kind of accept every so often there's going to be an explanation or a description or something. So when you know in a in a book, it's not 
like you know you you you're introduced to a character and it says you know oh the 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 hair is brown and the eyes are blue with a with a glow and you know something like that and so you don't really mind if it then goes on to say you know the, the the left arm has been partially replaced with a robotic one and you know if required the the robotic fist is strong enough to crush solid steel with ease you know you don't mind that but then in a movie you know you basically have to have a character point to the arm and say you've had that replaced haven't you and and they'll you know hold it up and say this fist can crush solid steel with ease if necessary, you know, and it just feels a little more awkward where, you know, I, I would say today we've reached a point where, you know, among other things, CGI can help in just, you can demonstrate, you know, you can maybe have like the first time you, you see the person, they, they, you know, attach the robot arm and then like just to test it, they pick up solid steel and crush it and then walk, you know. But in the 90s, that's just not how, you know, that would take a lot. Like, you'd have to make the entire arm, like, basically, in the 90s, if you wanted a robot arm, you just make something that looks like a robot arm, you attach it to the actual arm. But if you have to show it being attached, that's a lot more work. And, yeah, you know, so... It, it's a little more awkward. There's a lot. This movie has a lot of just stuff being explained and described. You know, there, there are some things that are shown where you kind of deduce, oh, that's that. Okay, sure. Because, you know, it's demonstrated sufficiently well that you can understand, you know, some characters have weapons where... Actually, I'm not 100% certain. Do they explain about the thumb? I'm not 100% certain because, again, like, they straight up, they show you. You know, he, like, detaches the, the thumb and you see the fiber wire and then he swings it and it cuts through something. And that's, you know, you as a viewer is like, I get it. That's, we can, we can move on. There's no more, need, but you can't do that with all of the things. And yeah, like the, when they, when we first see Jane, other characters literally say about her, she's been modified. And it's just, it's, you know, among other things, there's a lot in this movie of characters discussing things where basically everyone involved in the discussion already knows all the things they're saying so it's just for the audience's benefit and it's just also you know people don't talk like that in the real world and this is supposed to be very close to the real world you know i'm not saying everybody work, working on this you know had a lot of faith in the idea that 2021 would look the way this movie depicts it but there's, you know, that is the conceit of it, you know, and, you know, some sci-fi is aspirational. Some science fiction is basically like, wouldn't it be great if we could do that? So let's work our way to that. And it's not necessarily saying that's what it would look like. It's just saying, wouldn't it be amazing if you actually, you know. And some science fiction is a bit more pessimistic and basically saying, you know, the world's just going to look like this, right? It, it, you know, it's, 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 it's very cynical. It's not for everyone. But that's, yeah, it's a problem when you're trying to show what the world might look like and then you have people behaving in ways. You know, it's not like that, you know, people talking like that would be explained by the technology, for example. And it's a problem that since the movie, I'm not saying that it's just that I wish it were different. I, I genuinely feel this is an actual problem. This is not a matter of taste. It is a problem that since the movie wants to be accessible, they made the plot really insultingly easy to follow and don't really explore any of the complex ideas brought up beyond a superficial level. 
I'm not saying you're stupid if you had trouble following this, but I think it's more maybe you were distracted by some of the ideas in there that are very different from our current time. Because if you look at the plot itself, it's very, very easy to follow. It's really not very interesting. And that's... <laughs> it's very rarely a good thing if someone can accurately describe your science fiction... fiction... your scientific science fiction fiction as not being that interesting. That's, that's a really big problem. And, yeah, the movie doesn't really, you know, basically they did. You know, it, I, I guess it's maybe also in part because it wants to keep to a fast pace. You know, I'm not the world's biggest fan of the original Blade Runner. And it's not just because of how different it is from the book. But that movie isn't trying to be super fast-paced, and because of that, it can linger on some of these things, and you get a better sense of these things. And that's just, yeah, they, they don't do that in this movie because they want to, to keep things moving so fast. Now, let's see. You know, honestly, you could easily have the same plot of this movie set today even decades ago, before we had very much in the way of computers and such, all you had to do was alter the computer stuff itself. And that really shouldn't be true of a cyberpunk story. Like, imagine trying to change the Matrix into something that doesn't involve computers. And if you ask, well, what to replace the brain implant with, well, how about a tattoo on John Johnny's body with important info? And while the Matrix goes into extremely interesting ideas, it is still accessible to an average viewer, and this movie is basically one long chase. Now, let's see. You know, it's, it's integral to cyberpunk that it is in some ways different from the current time. Otherwise, what's the point? You know, it, you can have neo-noir... Actually... I'm not 100% certain if neo-noir has to also be science fiction or not, but you could just have noir, you know, if, if all you really wanted out, you know, that's the thing. This could very easily be noir, you know, or maybe, in, I guess in noir it wouldn't necessarily be a tattoo, but maybe it's information that he's memorized and he's refusing to give it up. So they, you know, they're, yeah, chasing him, trying to capture him so they can get the information. And you would still have a lot of the, you know, the, the, some of the, some of the things they point to where some people have a dangerous job, even though, like, basically, ideally in the real world, you should only have a dangerous job because you yourself feel like having that danger. You know, it sh no one should be forced to have an actually dangerous job. You know, if, if at all we can accomplish making jobs as safe as possible, you know, and that's just, you know, n noir stories, you know, were, are about a time where there was a lot of inequality, and neo-noir is basically saying the inequality that was in noir stories and is today will still be there. It might even be worse in the future. And, yeah. So with that said, the noir, some of the noir stuff, it does get, you know, the it, it does present a world that is different from what we live, you know, from 1995, you know. I, I want to say Speed came out in 1994. That movie is set in 1994, you know. that They didn't try to do sci-fi stuff. This one is sci-fi, and it's... It's in a... In some ways, you could conceive of the world eventually looking like it does in this movie... But the 
sorry, lost my train of thought. I will catch up to it pretty quickly. Wasn't going that fast anyway, so I can catch up to it on foot. Let's see. The let's see. The hmm. Yeah, maybe I'll maybe I'll move on. Maybe I'll think of it again later. But the right, yeah, the the. You know, the movie is trying to transport you to a different time. And it does, in, in a lot of ways, it's not very similar to our current, you know, the, the present day. Uh, just 1995's present day. And, you know, in creating such a different world, they get to make up a lot of the rules and content. And they did decide to make it very noir. There are some very... You know, the, the, I guess the, yeah, I should briefly, you know, in case you also, in, in case someone watching this isn't that familiar with noir, it is basically this very ground level kind of stories about crime, and a lot of the time, some of the crimes are committed because the people committing them simply could not, like they're crimes of necessity. They're not, sometimes they are like crimes of just greed. You know, someone who has more than enough, but wants even more, and so they commit crimes to get even more. But yeah, you know, it is. it has a lot of empathy for people who are not living, living in luxury. And there's a general sense that if you don't live in luxury, it is not your own fault. It is not because you screwed up. You know, it's simply that you did not have the chance to live in luxury. And as such, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of empathy in these stories for regular people. You know, it's... It's obviously impossible for all of us to be extremely rich. And what I, as a leftist, would point to as the ideal is for everyone to have enough, no one to have to go hungry or have to decide whether or not they're going to pay for their child's medication or for the, or the electricity bill for the month. You know, and yeah, so you know, noir and neo-noir have always really appealed to me. Now, in some ways, this movie is similar to The Matrix. So, brief spoiler for The Matrix. The things they have in common is the in The Matrix, the present-day grungy, dirty setting. I'm not saying that the action scenes set in The Matrix have very much, are, are particularly comparable to the action scenes in this movie. No more spoilers for The Matrix for the time being. Once again, this movie is not bad because it doesn't live up to as high of a standard as was set four years later by The Matrix. It's... I don't know that I would... Would I go so far as to say that it's bad? I guess ultimately it's just kind of average. It's not the worst thing ever made. And it has some stuff going for it. You know, again, it, it's been years since I watched Speed. I remember that as being a more competently made movie. Excuse me. And while that movie also has a very superficial kind of, you know, it's superficial from the get-go. Like, you, it's, it's right there in the concept. You know, you have a bus. If it slows down, it explodes. You know, that's, it's, it's, it's the most, it's the elevator pitchiest of elevator pitches. It is very, very, and the moment you sit down, you, you know, it's, it's a very simple superficial thing. And this movie didn't have to be that. It could have been smarter, more cerebral. But yeah, just as a brief, 
you know, among other things, the Matrix had slightly over twice the budget of this movie. You know, that had a sixty-three million dollar budget. This only had thirty million dollars. And I'm sorry, but as far as directors go, the Matrix had much more talented directors working on it. You know, I'm not saying that. Robert Longo, who directed this movie, isn't talented. I just... He's not a particularly good movie director. And The Matrix had a much clearer vision. You know, the the with this one, it gets kind of muddled. And, you know, this movie was never trying to be what The Matrix achieved being. And I take no pleasure in saying that this movie isn't as good as The Matrix. I would be ecstatic to love this movie like I love The Matrix, and I do think it has some things going for it. You know, I've always said that if if Philip K. Dick had been asked by Hollywood to write The Matrix, a lot of it would be the same as we, not all of it, but a lot of it would be very, very similar, possibly even the same as it is in the actual Matrix. You know, they, it's very clear that the Wachowski sisters, huge fans of Philip K. Dick, among many, many other things. And, yeah, this movie is literally, in fact, what happened when Hollywood went to William Gibson, told him, we want some of what you've written in, in books up on this uh, silver screen, but we also want it to be very crowd-pleasing. You know, the, the Matrix is crowd-pleasing, but not in conflict with the depth of the movie. Now, a few... A few things that I think are worth going into. Johnny can't himself access the the data, so you don't have to worry about him selling it to someone. He wouldn't even know who to sell it to. You pay him and he safely transports the data from point A to point B. You won't have to worry about someone grabbing it as you're transferring it online. That's something I saw. a lot of people were like, why wouldn't they just send it over the internet? Today, the internet is, you know, as long as you're using the right, you know, parts of the internet, it's a safe place. You know, you don't have to worry about, there, there are many places on the internet where you do not have to worry about viruses and all that kind of thing. This movie is set in a universe where that's just not the case. You know, again, this was a cynical read of what the internet, among other things, would look like. and. I mean, basically, this is the the movie and you know Gibson's other work describe a world where in a world where corporations have so much power that they don't have to, and if they don't have to, they won't care about what happens to regular people. So why would they make the internet safe? That's just going to make it more useful for regular people. If it's unsafe for regular people, but very safe for corporations, then people have to go to corporations if they want to use the internet safely. And maybe sometimes the... Eh, I suppose I won't go into that, but yeah. And you also don't have to worry about, like, keeping the information in a suitcase that might be stolen from you. And to those who say that it would be easier to have it on a USB drive, if you have to get through customs, and we're literally shown in this movie, you know, at the start of the movie, Johnny is in Beijing. And like I already mentioned, he's going to Newark. He's going through customs, whether he would like to or not. And there's some chance that they're going to confiscate it and look at the contents. And if they can't look at the contents, you know, maybe he'll be arrested and they'll and and held until they can read the contents, because they might figure that it's you know dangerous or something. And have to remember, this is a world where the regular person does not have that much 
freedom, that many rights. The corporations have the rights now. And that is a thing. I will admit the movie could do a better job of explaining that. And that's something where... I'm trying to wean myself off of constantly praising the work of Paul Verhoeven. But RoboCop does a better job of explaining that regular people don't really have very many rights anymore. You know, the right, the power is with the corporations, and they don't want regular people to have rights. That just means that they regular people have an easier time of fighting back against corporations. That is exactly what they don't want, you know. You know, in the in the eyes of a corporation, in, you know, a cyberpunk world and maybe the real world as well, you know, letting regular people have rights and freedoms still is basically like asking the fox to guard the hen house. You know, they specifically want for the, and, and yeah, RoboCop is a fairly fast-paced action movie, and that did manage to get that across. You know, how much power corporations have, how little power regular people have, and this movie, like, it gestures towards it, but ultimately there's not that many displays of how little power regular people have, how much power corporations have. And it is just like if they had just written it in a way that it, maybe it's in Gibson's original script. I have not read it. I, f I forget if it's even available. I, I think I read somewhere that it was available, but I don't tend to read scripts that, uh, yeah. But the, um, yeah, you know, the, the basic idea is that Right, with, with a rewrite, or maybe it was written and even shot, but edited out, it could have been in there. You know, you could have had direct displays of the power imbalance, and the movie does not do enough to show it. So I will say that in, in favor of, you know, the, the reviewers who, who didn't realize that. You know, if this is your first cyberpunk, yeah, you don't necessarily realize just how much power corporations are supposed to have and how little regular people excuse me and yeah so you know if, that's that's why it's not internet suitcase or USB if you you know for, for the data transport if you have something implanted in your head all you have to do is convince them that it's not an illegal thing and he does exactly that easily I'm not sure I'm going to give away exactly what, basically at, at at least one point in the movie, someone in authority scans him for illegal things, they find the thing in his head, and it's, yeah, that's fine, and they they think that it's something that's perfectly legit and i don't know maybe the movie should say it i don't think they do straight out they i don't think they do come out and say it but the sense that i got from having read william gibson is when he bought it it was a legit thing but he's you know picked it apart fiddled with it to where it would suit his purposes assembled it and had it implanted and a scanner can't tell that it's been fiddled with. I mean, you can basically think of it as the, the you know, cyberpunk equivalent, the, you know, the, 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 the implant in his brain that can store data is basically the, yeah, actually, now that I think about, yeah, I think, okay, yeah, I'll just briefly say, it's, he's scanned at least once, and it's identified as a dyslexia, ah, what's it called, like a, a program or something, like, and that makes sense, you know, in the future, maybe you can put something in your brain that means you don't have dyslexia anymore, 
So originally it was a dyslexia thing, but then he picked it apart, pulled out the program, and left like this hunk of empty storage space. And when he put it back, that means that he can now transfer stuff to that storage space. And yeah, and you know, this is also why the the you know, I I saw I saw at least one reviewer say if you were to have something like that and plant it somewhere in your body, your brain would be the last place you would want it. Well, if it's not in his head, if it's somewhere else in his body, a scan will be able to determine it's some sort of mini computer. Why would you have that anywhere other than your brain? They'd be able to tell you clearly don't need it because it's not in your brain, so it's not working with your brain. You know, and honestly, at least one of the trailers lays this out pretty well. So, I don't know, I guess maybe a lot of people don't watch trailers before going to see movies. I'll never understand that, but whatever, to each their own. But yeah, you know, it, it is, and, and it's also, it's one of these things of, in, in cyberpunk, the human body being used you know, it's it's essentially, it's the cyberpunk equivalent of forcing someone to carry a lot. You know, what? You Your back isn't broken. You have, you know, arm muscles, so carry a lot for your master, you know. The computer version of that would be put something dangerous in your brain and use that to, you know, it's it's offering a new vision of how human beings will be forced to put their own body at risk to the benefit of rich people you know and again i maybe it won't be honestly i can imagine that there won't be a hard drive up there but some sort of chip that does something to or for with your brain as far as I understand, that is coming in the future. Do they have any yet? I'm not sure if they have any yet, but certainly, you know, supposedly it's coming. And yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And again, this is something that you specifically see in, in some of these, you know. Yeah, you know, we've got some in Deus Ex. We've got Cybermercs, I guess, is one big case here. Yeah, and and um, system shock too. You know, Im implants, body implants. Now, William Gibson's cyberpunk writing is inaccessible. There's a lot of slang, and the world is very different from our own in a lot of ways. And and really, the I guess the One, and yeah, one of the things is when you read what he's written, it doesn't really read like it's been written for for us. It reads like it's been written for people who already live in that world. And again, that's something that a number of authors do. Just basically, you know, explain it as if it should already be common knowledge to you know he when you read his writing it'll say you know brain implant hard drive or something like that it won't you know if it was written for us it would say in the future it's you it's deemed useful for someone to have a hard drive implanted in their brain and here's why and here's how it works you know so and that's the thing, you know, the movie is made for us. The movie is made so that we can follow it without having to skip a few pages back and figure out if what's being talked about, you know. So you have characters stop what they're doing and talk about something in a way that's clearly for the benefit of the audience. It's, it's difficult to do a good cyberpunk movie because you you do kind of have to you know and, and again you know the matrix does solve this and i don't 
I don't think I really need to. Actually, yeah, just very, very briefly. So, spoiler for The Matrix, the first one. The way they get around the thing of having to explain to the audience why things are the way they are is that Neo is the audience surrogate. Everything is explained to him, and we accept that because he doesn't know why would he. He's new to this world just like we are. And the 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 Matrix itself, the, the present day world, the way he, you know, what they imitate in the Matrix doesn't have to be explained to us because it's just the year 1999. We, we were already living in 1999. We knew what it looked like. No more spoilers for the Matrix for the time being. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to do a good movie based on it, especially if you're also trying to make a crowd-pleasing movie, which was the case here. So, yeah, you know, I think it is more likely to get good adaptations of William Gibson's stuff in video game form. Once again, just look at the Deus Ex games and the System Shock games. Those really embrace what cyberpunk can do. And yeah, there's some explain, you know, tutorial style explaining, but they don't get bogged down. You know, that's that's the thing, you know, with um with a video game or a comic book, you can dive right into the world and people, you know, you basically just accept, oh, that's what that's how things are in this world. Where with a lot of movies and a lot of books, you do have to explain it. And the thing with the book is If you get it from the library, you won't have paid, so you won't have spent money on it. But if you're going to see a movie, you're paying theater tickets. That's what they want. You know, when they make a movie, if they put it in theaters, they want you to shell out hard-earned money, theater prices. And given that, it's just not... It's maybe not good business to make movies that are not very crowd-pleasing a lot of the time. Sometimes it, it does pay off if there's a large enough group of people who really love that sort of thing, even though it's not mainstream. And I'm not sure if there was enough of an audience for William Gibson cyberpunk direct adaptations in movie form in 1995. Honestly, I feel like ultimately, you know, I, I'm aware that Originally, Robert Longo and William Gibson just wanted like a million and a half and they wanted to do a black and white straight adaptation of the cyberpunk, of the, of the short story. And yeah, it would have been maybe 40 minutes or something and they weren't expecting it to be, and they, it was going to be maybe like a dark comedy kind of thing, which would make a lot of sense. His, his material makes a lot of sense for dark comedy, as long as you don't push it too far. And I can imagine that they weren't going to, but no studio would. And eventually they were just like, well, you can have 30 million if you'll make a crowd pleasing action movie. And so they went with that. And I just, I wish they had said, no, that's not what this movie is. You know, it doesn't make sense for this to be. Like, if you read the short story, I mean, I guess you can, if you read the short story and you knew nothing about the movie, you could tell how you, it could be turned into an action movie, but it really doesn't read like it's trying to be an action movie. Not even from like, again, I want to say 1984 or something, when it was written. It doesn't read like a 1980s action movie. It, it yeah, you know. And, let's see. yeah, now Wikipedia lists the following movies, and it's, you know, if, if you want the full list, if you go to Wikipedia and type in Cyberpunk, you can easily find this list. I'm only listing the ones that I've seen. And a few of them feel like the way that William Gibson writes Cyberpunk. Now, obviously not saying that that's the only way to do Cyberpunk. But the list. Alien, Escape from New York, Escape from L.A., Tron, Legacy, Blade Runner you know, Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049, Videodrome, Terminator 1, Terminator 2, Robocop 1, The Running Man, Total Recall, The Lawnmower Man 1 and 2, 
Demolition Man, Judge Dredd, both of them, Strange Days, The Fulfillment, Pi, Existence, The Thirteenth Floor of Matrix Trilogy, The Sixth Day, Minority Report, Paycheck, iRobot, Eon Flux, Ultraviolet, Scanner Darkly, District 9, Surrogates, Elysium, Chappie, Alita, Battle Angel. Sorry, that sounded like Alita Battle Angel. Those are not two different. It's the full title. So yeah, that gives you an idea of what Cyberpunk is. And as others have noted, one of the problems here is that when William Gibson wrote it, it was new. But by the time this movie was made, we had seen it done in other movies. So some of what we have here in this movie, by 1995, it was cliche. And again, you know, the list I just mentioned, notice how many of them came out before 1995, you know. And let's see. I do want to say there is some really good writing. There's, uh, you know, f early in the movie, Johnny comes upon a massive protest basically demanding that the government deals with NAS nerve attenuation, attenuation syndrome, which is basically like this... Yeah, and this is not a spoiler. Nobody really knows what causes it, but it basically makes your body shake uncontrollably the worse it gets. You know, it doesn't start out like that. And, yeah, you know... It's not, they don't go into a lot of detail, but yeah, basically it doesn't seem like the government is doing enough to, to address it, you know, and it's similar to how there were protests in America when the government wasn't taking AIDS seriously. I saw at least one person criticize, you know, oh, the protests, they're, they're waving flags that say NAS. It's, you know, you can't protest a disease well. There were protests regarding AIDS in America, and you know, yeah, the protest isn't saying that the virus or disease has, like, a boss that they want brought to justice by the government. They're communicating that they feel like the government isn't doing enough to help people. And again, you know, having read a number of cyberpunk stories, something that this movie doesn't communicate very well is the government isn't really doing very much that the corporations don't want, so... You know, if, yeah, they're not really listening to the citizens. And, yeah, you know, so Johnny comes upon this protest and maneuvers past it, suggesting that to him the protest is just a minor nuisance. He doesn't care about NAS, which tells us he's fine with the status quo in a movie that is critical of the status quo. And I'm not going to give away whether or not he grows, but it's a good way to effectively establish his relationship with his fellow men. You know, a lot of people in this, you know, in the, in the universe of this movie have NAS and, you know, the, the, yeah, Johnny doesn't have it and he doesn't really have a lot of relationships with people, so... It's not really a big deal to him. And the very first time we see him, it's clear that he's had sex with a prostitute. And we, we don't see the sex itself. That would be completely gratuitous. Meanwhile, the way they choose to communicate that they had sex is by us seeing her slip her panties back on, which is obviously, at least in part, you know, to have some sexuality in the movie. And she leaves almost immediately after telling us that he doesn't really have personal relationships, personal connections to the people around him, and that all his relationships with other people are strictly business. You know, it's it's not some prostitute. And, and it's also, I want to clarify, it's clear that she's an expensive prostitute, you know, so it's not, you know, and some expensive prostitutes, you know, they do have little bit of a relationship beyond the, the sexual and financial with some of their clients, and that's not the case here. And the movie doesn't, it doesn't feel like the movie is saying she is just cold and, and doesn't care about people. It's more that he doesn't really have, you know, I'm not saying that it's always the case, and I'm, I really, I hope I don't sound like I'm victim blaming here. But some of the time, 
if a person doesn't have, you know, yeah, doesn't doesn't really have relationships with other people, it's because they're closed off. It's not that no one around them is willing to have a relationship with them. It's that they just, they can't really open up and you kind of get the sense. And in fact, they have a very brief exchange and I kind of get the sense that if that exchange had gone better, maybe she would have stayed. You know, that basically, I think she asks, what is home to, to him? And he says, would you believe me if I said I didn't know? And basically that is, you know, it's true. He actually doesn't know. I might get into why in the review itself, but I'm not 100% certain. But that is, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a very, it's a, it's a fairly basic question. It's a, it's a way for her to try to connect to him. And it's not that he like goes out of his way to shut her down, but I think there's some chance that she maybe doesn't believe that he's being honest. It sounds, and, and other people in the movie communicate that they, they say to him, how could you not know? You know, but what is that? That doesn't make any sense. You know, so yeah, she probably thinks he's full of crap and she's like, whatever, I guess this is just a financial sexual relationship. If that's the way you want it to be, fine. We're, we're through. We had sex. You paid me. I'm leaving. And since she's the one who leaves rather than him like kicking her out which a lot of people you know a lot of people get very aggressive towards sex workers immediately after being with them because they feel like the sex worker seduced them and you know yeah since Johnny isn't the one kicking her out we get the sense that maybe he would like to have more relationships with people on, on some level you know, not not quite enough to know that he maybe needs to do a better job explaining why he, you know, how how could he how he could possibly not know what home is. And yeah, you know, when when he says no, you get just the slightest sense that maybe that is something that bothers him. And in fact, the right the the yeah. Not very long after, we do see he's trying to buy his memories back. He had lost a number of them, you know, based to make room for the brain implant. And that's why he agrees to a dangerous assignment. And, you know, this is filmmaking 101, but at least the movie does get it right. There is some competency on display. This is important stuff for us to know about our protagonist in this movie. I'm not saying it would be for every movie. And we're told almost immediately so the movie can move on from there and get to more challenging ideas than that. You know, excuse me, just set it up, build on it later. And very early on we see him on the job in a room and he puts a motion detector on the door just in case he'll need early warning of someone entering. And you know, we see him do something very similar to this more than once. You know, it, it's clear that he's aware that his job is dangerous, and this is his way of evening the odds. And I'd also like to point out that one major reason why someone might hire Johnny to physically transport data rather than using the internet is to try to keep it completely a secret where, you know, on the internet, there would be some trace. But as far as the writing goes, there are too many coincidences in how the plot progresses, a lot of really convenient writing to keep things moving fast and avoid introducing too many characters, and yet they still do manage to introduce too many characters. So they it just instead have too, you know, too little to do, too reason to be in the movie. You know, but yeah, con convenient in that the the person who can help out in the current situation is very easy to get into contact with you know it's not like 
as a quick yeah you know the the we have a movie where the protagonist doesn't know exactly how to get into contact with the people he needs to I'm not sure I want to I'm not sure I'm going to talk about in the review exactly why that is but you know he needs to get into contact you know the born ultimate sorry the born identity with Matt Damon is also a movie where the protagonist is trying to get in contact with someone that can help him and you know think about how many you know how many obstacles there are in that movie where in this it just keeps easily happening and it also makes a number of the you know so sometimes the progress feels very unearned because it's like well the, the characters didn't do that it just happened and there are some anticlimactic stuff and there's way too much exposition other people are always explaining what's going on to Johnny and MacGuffin chastening is of course a staple of movies not not every movie has it but many do you know this movie just has yeah I guess I'll, I'll just briefly give away so if you don't want to know exactly what's wrong with the MacGuffin writing you know mutant skip head this movie has way too many MacGuffins, and sometimes a MacGuffin will last one scene or a few scenes and then be replaced by another one when they get to that one, instead of a compelling way for the MacGuffin to remain the same throughout the movie, which is frequently how good movies handle MacGuffins. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of bad writing, there's a lot of things that don't hold up to scrutiny, ideas they didn't think through the implications of you know many people have criticized how the low techs are this organization of people who are rebelling against technology and yet they're using technology and the thing is in the short story the low techs really do reject technology you know they're they're a very different entity than in this movie but the way they are in the short story wouldn't be as useful for the movie, you know, for the movie purposes. So they rewrote the way the low techs are and didn't stop to think, we gotta change their name, we gotta change their their MO. We can't we can't simultaneously say that they're rebelling against because they're like and, and again this is revealed very early on. They're basically like a group of hackers. And it's like you can't you can't have both. Like, you don't have, you know, I, I, I doubt we'll ever hear Anonymous say, you know, the world should get rid of all technology and technology is a bad thing. Meanwhile, we did some hacking again. You know, it's just, that's not how, it doesn't make sense, you know, and it's just, the low techs are memorable in the short story and so they're put in the movie even though their presence contradicts their yeah their mo but the the movie does you know that there's a strong criticism of too much power in the hands of corporations allowing things to get really bad for regular people to the point where some are in very bad conditions even though the corporations have more than enough money that if they tried they could easily greatly improve conditions and again it's there. I wish the movie did more to really. What's the word? To, to really explore it. Now, as far as plot twists go, again, I would say that there's too many for sure, but they're not super difficult to follow. It's just the fact that the world. I can understand why some people were confused. I think maybe there should have been like maybe they should have put out like a, a I guess it wouldn't necessarily be a trailer, but like just a short video that explains the basics. Like a it's called a primer, I wanna say. We're just just explain cyberpunk is about this, this, and this. Here are some elements that are usually found in cyberpunk. Johnny Mnemonic is a cyberpunk movie, you know, but instead they, 
yeah, people got confused by, by some of the things and thus had a hard time following the movie. And ultimately, the, yeah, the plot should have been more complex. And today we do have big movies that move fast with a very complex plot. You know, the, I want to say Movie Bob was the one who just put out a review of Tenet. You know, that's a movie that has, you know, it, it moves very fast and has, it has big ideas, big budget, big, big scope, you know, so... Yeah, it is, uh, excuse me. Now, let's see. That brings us to... When I do these reviews, I try to highlight if there is, if, if there are maybe certain aspects of movies that, you know, where, where it's like, wow, I have got to see more work by that person. I'm not sure I would really say that's the case with this. I guess maybe if this was the first Dolph Lundgren thing I saw, I think it would make me want to see more with him in, in roles where he gets to be tough and intimidating and such. Henry Rowland's ranting is fun, but other than that, this doesn't really utilize the, the various, you know, yeah, the, the people working on it, both in front of and behind the camera, really don't put their best foot forward. And once again, some of it is executive meddling. And let's see, yeah, so you can really tell that Rob Longo had not directed a movie before, you know, it's not a bad thing that there are music video directors directing movies. Yes, sometimes it's McGee, but Zack Snyder has, you know, he, he does, there are aspects of, of handling an overall film that he handles well. I'm not going to go too much into him here. And... I'd like to think there are very few people who would say that David Fincher is not a good director, and he did start directing music videos, you know, so, but this was just a case where he did not, he couldn't, it's, there, there are a ton of things that a movie has to do that a music video does not, you know, you, you, some people can, can handle that jump, not everybody can, and Robert Longo, at least at this point, when he made this movie, he couldn't. And yeah, he's he's not that good at directing the story. That that I, actually that might be part of why some people had a hard time following it as well. And that is, it is a difficult thing, you know, to to get the story. You know, yeah, and just some things don't really feel like they flow naturally from. And the opening of the movie is one of the worst things. So if if you can honestly the movie opens with a with a text crawl. I want to say it's called crawl. And I'm not gonna go too much into like the, the comparison to, to Star Wars. Other people have done a good job comparing it to the Star Wars text crawl. Basically the uh, Honestly, I would kind of recommend just, like, like barely, barely pay attention to the text roll. Just look enough at it to know when it's done, and then start watching the movie, because everything in it, the movie itself tells you. And, again, that is very unlike the, the Star Wars, you know, the Star Wars text crawls are a good, the, the, yeah, primer is maybe a good word for that. You know, to put you... It tells you some of the really important stuff you need to be aware of, and yeah, this one just doesn't. I it, it's very clear that the it was added by executives who did not have faith in the storytelling, and in part you can understand that, but it it did not need to be there, and it it's just really unwieldy 
some of the information in it doesn't even come into play for a long time in the movie. And no, there's there's nothing in the text crawl that you need to be told via text crawl before because everything is and, and that's the thing, like the, the text crawl does explain what NAS is. And I find that if you watch the movie not and, and basically don't pay attention to the text crawl, the movie itself first of all does explain it, and second of all, it explains it at the time when you should start to really pay attention to it, you know. So, yeah. And I think when it explains, I, if I recall, it explains it after we've seen the protest. So, you know, if you watch the movie, you ignore the text scroll, you see the protest, and it's like, wow, that is a big protest. These people are very passionate. And they're protesting, let's see, it says NAS on the flag. I wonder what that is. And then later when it's explained, you're like, oh, wow. So, you know, then it, it's, it's, it's much better than if you, yeah. And the ending has several ridiculous elements. And I would say, ultimately, the movie is just surprising enough to not be boring. But others have pointed out that it, on the other hand, it can get very boring because of the, the way it's paced, which again, just, there's a huge difference between directing music videos, you know, four minutes of content versus, you know, 90 some minutes or more. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, this is a loose adaptation, but the original story would not have made for feature length without some pretty big changes, so, yeah. And some of the, the body modification and unique weapons are used quite well. Now, as far as the characters go, Considering Molly Milligan's the badass woman that William Gibson writes in his book, and, you know, yeah, it's in, in the short story, it's her. Excuse me. There we go. In the movie, she's replaced by Jane because the rights for Molly Millions were tied up with another uh, studio who were trying to adapt the... I think the entire Sprawl trilogy, but to start with New Romancer, which is the first book in the Sprawl trilogy, and Molly is a major character in that, so, yeah. It's not a problem that they changed Molly to Jane, it's a problem what how they handled Jane. Basically, Jane, some of the time, Johnny protects her more than she protects him. Yeah, overall, I think... He probably protects her more than she protects him. And there are times, like, she's supposed to have super reflexes. And there are times where it's like, how did she not notice that? How is she this slow, even though she has... And, and honestly, they could have just, hypothetically, if they had added something about, like, in certain areas, there's too much electromagnetism for her heightened reflexes. I don't think that makes sense, but at least it would be there. And then it could be like, oh, okay, it must be a place with electromagnetism, you know. But it's not explained, so it's just like, I mean, the only, literally the only reason in the book, you basically accept that Johnny is not really a fighter. He's, you know, he's, he's a courier. Like, imagine... Channel, challenging a, a UPS man to a martial arts... It's, no, that's not his job. That's not part of his job description. And, yeah, you know, in in both of these... In both movie and short story, the the... You know, she is there as the bodyguard for Johnny. And in the book, you get why he needs a bodyguard. And in this, it's like... I mean, he doesn't really need... A lot of the time, he doesn't seem to really need her help. 
and you know it's a Hollywood action movie, so of course the lead can fight, especially because you know in in 1995 you're not gonna have an American movie blockbuster action movie where a woman is constantly protecting a man, especially now if the man is the protagonist, and Johnny is the protagonist, so, and, and it just ends up feeling like, I, I guess she's there so that he can explain stuff to her, and she does help, but not very much with fighting, and yeah, you know, she's there because she was in the book. I do appreciate that at least they didn't make her some sort of goody two shoes. She's motivated by selfishness, not altruism. Meanwhile, in the book, you're not sure exactly what her motivation is at all, which is obviously more interesting. Actually, I forget if it's the short story or the sprawl story, but you know, yeah, it's obviously much more interesting. But yeah, it's like they don't think that it's gonna work. If, excuse me, if they don't explain it, so. They explain it, and it's, excuse me, it's fairly boring, you know, and, yeah, you know, it, it does feel like she's, in part, she's there because it's a blockbuster, so you have to have a hot chick have a major role in the movie. She doesn't say or do that many important things, so clearly they didn't care that much about her character. And Ice-T basically plays, you know, the not-too-distant future version of himself. He resists the government, spreading truth about what it's like living at the bottom of society, how difficult it is to get out of that existence. I haven't watched everything he's in, but I have heard that after this he learned how to act, and I have no reason to doubt that, but boy, is he stiff in this. And I hate saying that because I love his music and his attitude. Now, you might be surprised... In this story, he doesn't live in L.A. I guess he just had to get out of the home with the body bag. And I will never complain about Udo Kier showing up in something. And this doesn't use him a lot, but he's good. He's he's always good, you know. And Henry Rowland's ranting. Yeah, I, I, I'm never going to complain about that. I think he was one of the few things I liked in... Bad Boys 2. Yeah. If, if I recall. I'm pretty sure that's the one that he's in. Basically, Keanu is not very good in this. You know, the, the... I've seen several say he's basically as good as his director, and since the director is not very good at directing actors... Yeah. It's... And, and he's very over-the-top at times. I've always said that I like when he plays anti-heroes, when he stars in an action movie and his character has an edge to him, you know, Speed, Constantine, Street Kings. It doesn't really work here, and yeah, you know, some of it is also the writing. Some of the, some people say he's miscast, uh, sleepwalking, looks bored, has only two emotions throughout. You know, yeah, he is basically, he's either stoic or annoyed, bordering on, sometimes reaching, angry. That's pretty much it. There's not a lot of depth, and he's not... It's not a problem for a protagonist to not be very likable, but for one thing, at times, they push it way too. Like, he is... There, there are some things he does in this movie where you pretty much hate his guts, and that's just not... At the end of the day, the movie is hinging on us caring what happens to him, what happens to, you know, like, basically, he's, he's significantly threatened in this story, and it's just not, yeah, you know, it doesn't work very well for it to, yeah, and Dolph Lundgren is very bad and over the top as well, but at least his character is pretty fun, in part due to being so over the top, and, you know, basically, he's, like, this, he plays Carl, the street preacher, who, like, he's super enhanced, you know, and he, yeah, like, he's almost addicted to, to enhancement, and he, you know, you can hire him for some really messed up stuff, and he'll agree, because he, you know, if you, if you can pay enough, he'll agree. And, 
yeah, Dina Myers as Jane, at times over the top, and at points, ultimately, I'm not, it's not really that much of the time, but, like, her eyes, I think, yeah, like, she'll, she'll bug out her, her eyes in a kind of awkward way, and it just, it doesn't really work. Again, I don't mind that automatically, but it doesn't really work for this sort of thing, and she's definitely supposed to be at least somewhat appealing. We're supposed to think that she's cool, attractive, and I think also maybe kind of... We're supposed to be at least somewhat on her side, and we're basically on her side, more or less. Uh, you know, despite the, the relative selfishness she, she operates based on. But she's really not that cool. The movie is way too... Like, every so often she gets to, to do some fighting, but... Like I said, she doesn't, it doesn't feel like she's needed. It feels like Keanu could basically handle himself. And I saw at least one reviewer say that she's just not convincing as a bodyguard. Yeah, I, maybe. I, I love her in Starship Troopers, and I swear I'm not going to... That's... I'm not, I'm not going to go off on a, on a thing about how amazing that movie is and how amazing Paul Verhoeven is. But that, you know, that same reviewer says Miljovic would have done a better job, and I have to agree. She would have been spot on for, for this. And, yeah, there, there are too many villains and too many good guys. And in both cases, they should have simply combined some of these characters. And it, it really wouldn't have taken very much of a, of a rewrite. And, and the thing is that frequently it's just, you know, Johnny and Jane will go to a place, they'll do a thing, and maybe they'll meet one of these characters. Or maybe they'll find something that leads them to one of these characters. Then they'll go to that character. Maybe that character will take them to another place, and maybe send them to another character. So obviously they need more. They need multiple characters so they can keep being sent to new ones. And it just feels like you can you can feel how awkwardly it's it's just not good writing to to constantly have characters be sent ahead to to someone else. Yeah, and. Yeah, there's way too much exposition in the movie. And characterization is too on the nose. In some ways, this movie is too similar to other science fiction films, such as Blade Runner. Ultimately, the very specific William Gibson cyberpunk aesthetic is present here in a way that it isn't really in other movies that came before, at least not as far as I've seen. And as far as I understand, it is, uh, yeah. Now, the act action is shot somewhat poorly and yeah the editing I I'm not sure that the editing I don't really want to blame the editor too much Ronald Sanders because he's edited a lot of David Cronenberg I, I'm just briefly gonna scanners videodrome the dead zone firestarter the fly naked lunch M. Butterfly, Existence, Spider, A History of Violence, Eastern Promise is a Dangerous Method. Oh, sorry. That was all of them. Sorry. And yes, I do read... Sorry. Firestarter is not... Uh, was not directed by... Cronenberg. And I'm not saying that all of those movies are amazing. I remember The Dead Zone as being fairly underwhelming. But those movies are well edited. And... You know, those movies have an edge to them. This movie was supposed to have an edge to it. In, in some ways it does, in some ways. So it's not... They, they didn't choose the wrong guy. I think it's because the executives went in and just over... Like, vetoed. Kind of, they were like, nope, you gotta... Instead of this, this, and this, you gotta do that, that, and that. And, yeah. But, yeah, it is... You know, you can really tell that the movie was taken by executives from the director and made more commercial and they didn't really have the footage to handle more commercial so they just had to piece it together the best they could and I will say you know this was back 
When you see cyberspace in this, it is very visual, as was the style at the time. It has a look that fits with the rest of the movie. It's still kind of grungy and dirty, and you get the sense that the people who live in this world didn't want for cyberspace to be escapism. They wanted it to be comfortable. They wanted it to be the, the same as the, the rest of their world. And obviously the effects are dated, but it still looks decent as the, you know, obviously if you don't like a visual cyberspace, then you're not going to like it. And it's that, I think when this movie came out, people were pretty sick of, you know, Lawnmower Man, at least the first one, I'm not sure about the second one, had come out. Yeah, I th yeah, the second one's from 96, but the first one had come out, so we'd more or less like okay that was that was that was a lot of vr i uh, don't think we need more than one movie with that and hollywood keep kept churning them out and yeah but william gibson did describe cyberspace as very visual i forget if it looked quite like we we see it here but i think it was a, a fairly decent representation now yeah, and, um, you know, they, they use live-action practical effects for a number of things. And some of it works out, but, again, it's this thing of, like, if you... I don't blame Robert Longo because dealing with special effects is a very difficult part of direction. It's, it's not... it doesn't come very naturally to you. You know, it's impossible to, to tell one of your actors, just do it the way you would naturally, you know, imagine if you actually were saying these words to a friend of yours or a parent or a lover or something, you know, and they can, okay, I'll, I'll put myself in that mindset. You can't do that with the facts. So it's, it's very technical and the first times you, you work with special effects, I mean, some, yeah, sometimes it's handled by a second unit, and I don't know if that was the case here. Honest, okay, I'm sorry. If the special effects were actually handled by second unit, then I do think they could have done a better job. Uh, maybe it's a budget issue, but certainly they, yeah. But it's it's possible that Robert Longo insisted on doing it himself. Once again, not knowing what his limits were. There are there's some good stunt work, but. Sometimes there are also some, you can tell that that's not a stuntman, that's a, that's a dummy. And you do get to see a number of different places in this world, and there's a very noticeable difference between the expensive hotels and, you know, corporate headquarters and such, and the more poor neighborhoods. And it gets across that a lot of people live very hard lives in this world, despite all the technology that we thought would make life better. And that's maybe, yeah... I do think that the visual storytelling of that, the world building of just seeing, you know, yeah, <clears throat> you know, the, there are multiple scenes in this where the characters are near just like garbage bags out in the open and, and such, you know, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a place where you wouldn't want to go there, but clearly a lot of people do have to go there. The action scenes, they're awkwardly framed. There's a pretty decent amount of action scenes, and they do a they do a decent job of making them distinct, of you know, utilizing the various elements they have at their disposal and making it like some of the action scenes have stuff and that you feel like you would you would really have to rewrite some of these action scenes if they weren't taking place in a cyberpunk world. One of the main aspects of filmmaking, one of the, the biggest deals, is to successfully convince the audience that what they're seeing is really happening. And this is, of course, a challenge when you have things like special effects and stunts, where for a you know, there are several major things that supposedly happened that didn't even remotely happen. And this requires good coverage, good editing, and this movie lacks both. And 
yeah, the, the coverage and the editing very frequently doesn't actually look like a per you know, it doesn't look like a person supposedly shot actually was shot. You know, it's it's very obvious that the person firing the gun, the person being hit, are two separate things awkwardly edited together. You know, to appear to be happening one right after the other. And this is one of the biggest cardinal sins of an action movie, and it happens a number of times in this movie. It's not limited to specific scenes or a specific chunk of the movie. At points, it will cut way too slowly from footage of someone shooting to footage of someone being hit. And that pause in the flow means that it doesn't feel like the person shooting and the person hit. Or, you know, that it's the same situation. You can tell that they were filmed apart and... It's really too bad because they do get some things right. Early action scenes are very straightforward, so it's easy to follow what's going on. Later on, you know, over the course of the movie, it introduces more elements, you know, specific weapons, factions, characters, you know, and yeah, later later action scenes will utilize these elements, including more memorable settings than earlier. You know, it manages to build to a decent climax, which is bigger in scope than earlier action scenes, so it's really too bad that the action isn't more well done, and when I say decent, I'm maybe being kind of forgiving. The movie does get very disturbing at times. Ultimately, the other than the street preacher, the villains are not that interesting. I mean, the they maybe have some interesting weaponry, but that's... yeah, and... You know, John himself is an a-hole who's given a chance to grow. You know, idealism and class struggle are themes, but they could be handled a lot better. And... Yeah, you know, once you... It, it takes a little getting used to that some of the things in the world of the movie is so different from our world. But other than that, it is fairly easy to follow. You know, it's not very and it, maybe some of the time the action is hard to follow but other than that now the music and score you know it was done by brad fidel known for terminator one and two and he does well as usual for this sort of thing a lot of electronic notes in there since there's a world full of like electronics a lot of tension in it since it's a dangerous world. Fast paced because things can go very wrong very quickly in this world. And the movie sometimes tries to be funny. It isn't always. It certainly. A lot of the humor I don't think was intended. Like, I don't think we're supposed to find Street Preacher as funny as we do. I think he's supposed to be disturbing. Excuse me. Now, let's see. There is some strong graphic violence, and, you know, some of it we're supposed to find catharsis in, some we're supposed to be disturbed by. It works okay. I've seen a number of reviews say that the movie is too violent. I think it may be... It definitely... There are points where the, the violence makes sense like obviously there's going to be some violence when there you know one of the people has a you know fiber wire thumb but it's it's at least a little more violent than it needed to be and there are scenes where like individual little sequences where there's way more violence than really is to the movie's benefit and I don't know if it was Robert Longo who felt that it made sense, you know, added an edge to it, or if it was executives who were like, well, we have a bunch of other crowd-pleasing stuff. Let's get a lot of violence in there. Now, as far as sexual materials, the movie is fairly mild. And as others have pointed out, some of the... You know, some of the cyberpunk, grungy, dirty sets are too shiny when it's meant to be grand. There's, there's too much light on them. And it's, again, just... I really don't mean to be going after Robert Longo, but ultimately, I do think that he should have 
I realize that the DP is uh, has a lot of responsibility for the lighting, but Longo should have been able to tell this is not going to work well for Cyberpunk. And again, I'm some of the other movie, you know, Blade Runner is a really good example of. Think about how dirty and grimy and unpleasant some of the parts of the world look in that. And that that's how cyberpunk is. I'm sorry, this review is ending up much longer than I thought it would. But I am fairly close to being done. And tonally, the movie also takes itself too seriously. And as others have pointed out, the sets look cheap. Some of them were... I, I don't know... Or, I don't know for sure if they were, but they look like they were made from cardboard, and maybe some of that is the, the low budget, but maybe they should have just trimmed down so there weren't as many settings so they could focus on making the settings they do have look better. And the pacing is off. And let's Yeah, and so basically the movie is, let's see, 88 minutes without end credits and 93 with them. And, you know, if you enjoy watching it from fairly early on, it is worth sitting through at least once, whether you're enjoying it ironically or unironically. You get a good sense of what it's like fairly early on. And it is fairly unique in a number of ways. If you very badly want some of William Gibson's writing up on the screen, this gets it, even if it doesn't really do it all that well, a lot of the time at least. And yeah, so the worst aspect of the movie is the acting and the direction. And let's see. What, you know, before watching this, I, I bought it specifically because I was a huge fan of William Gibson. And I was just, I was really excited to see his writing up on the screen, and it didn't really meet my expectations. And most of the cast have done better work elsewhere. And the movie is fun to watch if you're in the right frame of mind, but it's not really a good movie as such. You might like the film if you're a huge fan of William Gibson and you'd be okay with something that's not that great of a representation of his work, but at least have does have his traits in there. Like, if you've read William Gibson, you could watch this, have no idea that it has anything to do with William Gibson. Like, if you don't know the short story, if you don't see his name in the credits, you would still be able to tell, okay, this is William Gibson. Now... Ultimately, I, yeah, I give this movie five odd acting choices out of ten. That is my final rating, and yeah, we've reached the, oops, the spoiler section. That took way longer than I thought it was going to. But here we are. And I will get into the disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I'll try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I can try to talk very fast during the disclaimers since a lot of it is very standard information. I'm going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. And yeah, so from here on out, there are major spoilers without warning for, for this movie, not for... If, if I spoil anything else, I will warn and hold up index finger. And... I don't have a problem with violence and gore in general. I think it's one of my favorite horror movies and movies in general. I also love Cronenberg's The Fly, Video Drone, etc. 
and I don't have a problem with film sexuality, maybe the storming setting the children general monstrous more on period movies. I might swear in this video. Instead of me quoting all the lines that I love from this movie, let me just say every single line in the I'm to be my little quote section, I either love or hate. You can probably tell which is which based on my based on the review itself. So you can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. And let's see here. Yeah, so the following is a short list supplied by the IMDb Marvel List list of movies that are supposedly similar to this, and I might compare this to some of them. And if I spoil them, I'll let you know first. A scanner darkly, that that makes sense, because that's also cyberpunk. It's not just that both of them star Keanu Reeves. Universal, so sorry, which I gave an 8 out of 10. Universal Soldier, 8 out of 10. Speed, 7 out of 10, I think. The Replacements, 6 out of 10. I mean, yeah, I'm sorry, but those three are just because, you know, some of them, you know, Universal Soldier has Dolph Lundgren, and Speed and the Replacements has Keanu Reeves. That's all. That's... Otherwise, they're not similar. I, I would compare this more to Blade Runner. But anyway. So, let's see. Yeah, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some of it is MSC3K riff tracks and other jokes. And, let's see. Yeah, the time codes for the sections are in the description box. Thoughts that I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. Second section is thoughts that I had before watching. And finally, I get into stuff that I think is worthwhile to get into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, MDB, and Wikipedia. In the in the, yeah, in the final section. And Sorry, scrolling through the stuff that is not relevant. Right, so I got this movie on sale, so anything negative in this video is not out of bitterness. I also do not feel like the movie wasted my time or forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to what it's adapting or the movies like it. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it to the best of my ability. The negative things I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Now, I first watched this in 2006. And let's see. Right, that brings us to the next section. Notes taken while watching. Excuse me. I appreciate that the movie sets up that the defecting scientists did hire some security. They're not. Uh, one second. It did not take all of my notes here. Let's see. Yeah, they're they're aware that. You know, naive. That's it. They're not naive enough to think that they can't possibly that there can't possibly be any problems. And this also sets up that the Yakuza are really tough. That they can take out all of these armed guards. I agree that the movie overall has too much exposition. Characters will discuss things just so that the information in the discussion can be conveyed to the audience. But the talks between Johnny and the defecting scientists feel to me like the scientists just memorize the information that they're telling Johnny because they're new to this, they're nervous, that's how a lot of people behave when there's a situation that they don't feel comfortable in. They get chatty and ramble on about the details of the situation. Meanwhile, Johnny has to explain certain things to them, again, because they're so new at this. For sure, later in the movie, it's, you know, no longer as well explained. Or, I don't know, maybe the problem is 
just that while it is sufficiently explained, it's frustrating storytelling. It's a frustrating storytelling method. I saw at least one person say that the elevator is ridiculously slow considering all the scenes we see in the hotel room. I would have to agree. Obviously, the reason that we see the elevator so long before it actually arrives is that they're trying to build tension and suspense, but, you know, it betrays that they didn't carefully write out the scenes in a way that it made sense to intercut them. You know, if you have one really, one thing that should go by really quickly and one really long scene it's important for the scene to be long because we're being told a lot of information i'm not saying they could trim down the hotel room all that much honestly i guess maybe we should see them in the car on the way there instead of us the you know the moment we see the yakuza they're stepping in the elevator and it's like five minutes before they arrive like and, and yes, I, I saw the number, I saw that it's a crazy high floor that they had to get, or wait, am I thinking of, or was that the, no, I think, because we, yeah, because we see Johnny in the elevator, and it goes up to a really high number there, but when he's in the elevator, I, I'm fairly sure he's in there for very little time. Now, at least one person claimed that you know, the thumb fiber wire is just as likely to hit yourself as to hit someone else. I realize that at the end of the movie, his weapon is briefly used against himself, but he never seems even remotely close to hitting himself when using it himself. I mean, are people seriously arguing, well, that weapon would take practice to use? Literally every single weapon ever developed would take practice to use. Yes, some significantly more practice than others, but some people do use weapons that are, you know, that require extreme practice before you start using them. Now, let's see. You know, the the one thing that came to my came to mind immediately when I, you know, would be like a sniper rifle. You know, sure in the movies it looks easy, but you have to take a lot of things into account when using that. You know, I so I just have to wonder if the people who said that oh, the the thumb fiber wire would be a bad weapon, well, do you all do you say that when you see a sniper in a movie as well? Because usually it's just that you're used to those. It's not that that would be any more or less convenient than a thumb fiber wire. I don't know. Maybe okay. Maybe I shouldn't be comparing, you know, short range and long range weapons. Let's go with like a knife. You know, like a. a a butterfly knife, for example, you know, that's like the first time, not that I've tried, I, you know, I don't, I don't carry a knife or something, but as far as I'm aware, the first time you try to do the flippy thing to open a butterfly knife, you're going to look ridiculous. It's going to take a lot of practice to get it right. Same thing for the thumb wire, you know, and let's see. You're Johnny. He said he was Johnny. Did he say he was Johnny, or did did you say it and he picked up on it? Sometimes it just it makes the movie go by faster if you remind yourself of better movies. So yeah, after you know Johnny runs out of the the play, you know he 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 detonates the the yeah yeah I saw one person say ah oh, brilliant put an explosive. You see him blow it up. It's obviously not a bomb. I, I saw someone else correctly identify it. It's a concussive blast. It's the equivalent of like a flashbang or something like that. It's just supposed to disorient the other people. Of course, he's not going to put an explosive on the only entrance he knows. You know, and I saw someone else say, well, how can he know that they're going to use He's intending to use it. He's going to set it off and then run through there because that's the area that there was this disorienting effect. It's possible that there are other exits and entrances. He doesn't know that for sure. He can't go. It's not like he's in any position to go around checking. 
The guy isn't gonna let him do that. There are plenty of actual problems with the movie. Don't complain about things that are only, that only appear to be an issue to you because you didn't pay attention to the movie. Now the the but yeah, so you know he sets off the concuss. You gotta love the one-liners in this, you know. Anchovies, you know, and time, and then he sets off the the concussive blast. And it's just terrible one-liners. Anyway, after he does that, he runs out, and the guy comes out, and he's like, "Got all night, a eh ho," and then like, you know, uh, two minutes later or something, a second bad guy shows up, and it's like, you know, okay, he's there so that J Bone has someone to kill. Where was this guy? when the other guy was looking for Johnny. Might have been useful to have two people when you're looking for someone so that you can cover each other's back. In fact, that is the entire problem that with him being alone out there, you know, he... And it's just like, why didn't he call for the other... If there was another guy, we don't know. I, I don't think we know that there's more than one guy there until... Actually, wait, was he just more confused by the concussive blast? You know, it just... Yeah, in that case, what I would do, if I were him, is just stand with my back to the, the entrance and exit, and, like, yell to the guy, come out as soon as you can, okay? And then just stand there and, and look in different directions, see if I could spot the guy I was after, because then Johnny would not be able to get past him, and then, the, you know, and then once the other guy comes out, then they can cover each other. And I saw someone else point out, J-Bone ghosting away, even Batman couldn't pull that off. And yeah, it is ridiculous. Okay, the reveal that the bartender has a robot arm is slightly cute. Like, you know, I, I, let's see, is it when, yeah, I think, you know, I keep calling. I keep wanting to call her Dizzy. I'm sorry. To me, Dina Meyer is Dizzy. You know, but yeah. Jane walks up to him and is like, "Give me my stuff." And he reaches it. Oh wait, no, sorry. It's right before that actually. I think it's that he, you know, he picks something up and he's gonna clean it, and then up the robot arm comes and he pauses briefly and then he starts using it. You know, this is neat little yeah. Ambiguity is all well and good, but was Jane seriously, like, she says she's coming back for Ralphie f for not hiring her? And Okay, to be fair, he insulted her by saying maybe she should be a prostitute. I mean, ultimately, we don't find out if she was going to physically hurt him or if she was going to kill him, but still, like, I'm coming back for you. For what? For not hire? It just, it, and it's not like he doesn't explain why. You know, I get that, I mean, I guess basically it's that, you know, it's essentially the equivalent of him refusing to hire a handicapped worker, you know, because he doesn't want to put in the effort to make his, the job handicap accessible or something like that, you know, but yeah, it's just, I don't know, I guess it's supposed to make her look tough and edgy. And I'm sorry, when when Shinchi cuts Ralphie, that looked very bad. That was really not very convincing. And I'm with that one guy who said, why is Shinji stopped by that like there's there's like a chain link fence or something? And it's like, why can't he cut through that? We see him cut through steel. So of course he should be able to cut through. And it's just so weird. Like just just put something in his path that he literally can't cut through. Like ah crap, let me think. There's gotta be something. Well let's yeah, let's say that Johnny, you know, Johnny and Jane run out through somewhere and they like knock something over so there's like an absurd amount of stuff. Yeah, let's say that like they knock over a there's a there's a uh, load bear, sorry, not a load bearing, but like a, 
uh, what are they called again? But yeah, you know, a, a, a tall thing. And they like push her. Yeah, like it's, she's supposed to be, she's at least supposed to be faster. I guess, I'm not sure they say that she's stronger also. But maybe she does something that because of the speed knocks it over and blocks his path. So that like even if he did cut through it, it would take a while. So, something like that, but not just a fence. So Jane is going to stay around with Johnny, not because she cares about him, but because she believes that he's not going to pay her if she doesn't stay around. Again, I appreciate the moral ambiguity, but it just feels very awkward and forced. Like, I mean, you almost might as well have had Jane say, the movie script dictates that I stay around, but just, I just want you to know it's not because I care about you. I just, it's, it's, I get it. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't have an account he can wire it to, and he's not carrying cash, but still. And Jane asks some questions about the information Johnny carries, and he's like, rule number one, never open the package. That's, that was a little too British for us, but yeah. Again, I just, I gotta remind myself of better movies. And I'm not saying that movie is a masterpiece, but it's certainly much better than this in a lot of ways. The action is much more well handled. I appreciate the brief knowing look of sympathy from the random extra who gets a close-up when Jane has the black shakes, you know, right before Johnny's about to leave her behind in a pile of garbage bags, you know. The, the, but anyway, yeah, the, the extra, there's this resigned element to the look on the woman's face like she's seen this a hundred times before she knows that there's nothing she can do to help but it still hurts to see it you know sometimes the editing has some really great yeah you know it's a, it's an edit that takes focus away from our protagonist just briefly but it it really adds the fact that Spider lifts Jane's top to tell the audience that, you know, she she's not wearing a bra, it's kind of creepy by the movie. Like, supposedly the scene is meant to make us empathize with Jane's problem, but it also sexualizes her against her will. I saw at least one person question why the bartender can feel the pain in his robot hand, saying, why would you program, why was I programmed to feel pain? For one thing, to make people more comfortable, you know, around your robot hand, and by being closer to the, the arm he was born with, and in part to make you better at using the hand. Think about how difficult it would be to use your hands if your fingers couldn't feel anything. I'm actually not aware of how, I, I know they have some prosthetics, I, I don't know if those can sense, you know, touch yet but and even if you say well why not make it so it can feel other things but not pain maybe so that he can feel if there's something that's hurting the robotic hand damaging it he's a bartender he's not expecting to feel a lot of physical pain and some reviewers think that spider slams the brakes but wasn't able to stop the car before hitting street creature others think that he hit the gas pedal I'm not 100% sure, and I do think that's the fault of the editing. I think it was the gas pedal. Now, yeah, let me, I'll, I'll just very briefly, you know, so, okay, so the movie, Johnny is sent to the hotel room, and he goes there, and, you know, they tell him to go to Newark, so he goes there and he you know yeah and and he he contacts Ralphie and and says you know the the people there were killed you're the handler you handled you know you set this up what do I do now and Ralphie sends him somewhere so Johnny goes there then you know Jane comes and gets him out of there then he goes you know he he He's constantly being told where to go by other people. It doesn't, like, 
organically come out of. Uh, again, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to spoil the Matt Damon Born Identity, but think about how much smoother it handles that sort of thing. You know, there are times in that movie where it's not that he's really being told. He's just, he's following leads, and he's thinking about what would make sense, what would make the most sense to do, where in this, it's just everywhere he goes, someone shows up and tells him where to go. You know, it, it just, and the thing is, if instead he had to know this world, which would make sense, and he, he's living in, I don't know, I guess the idea is supposed to be, well, long-term memory's gone, so, you know, but if he had to know, then the movie would have to find another way of explaining why is he going there, where if someone tells him you have to go there because of this, then the audience will basically accept that, but it just, it's really tiring to have scene after scene of him contacting someone, going to a place, then leaving, going to another place. It just, yeah. I saw at least one person say that it doesn't make sense that Pharmacom developed the cure if they weren't going to... I just briefly have to point out, I voice type these notes in, in Google Docs, and it, it works really well most of the time. Every time I voice type the words, the cure, it thinks it's the band regardless of context, so it capitalizes both words. That's just funny to me. Anyway, why would Pharmacom develop the cure if they weren't going to use it on anyone? Well, they are going to use it, but only on the very top brass, higher than even Takashi and his family, because they don't trust him. That's why Shinji went rogue on him, which is literally something that the ghost in the machine tells us and him. I mean, right now there are bank executives who want to be given the corona vaccine before the lower level people, they're they're forcing to work despite you know just and beyond yeah you know beyond that, Pharmacom doesn't want to give the cure to regular people because it's easier to make money from treating the symptoms than curing, which I think might be accurate to at least some real world situations. I'm not 100% certain if there is. I'm not 100% certain there's been a situation where a corporation could cure something but chose to instead just treat the symptoms, but I, I'm aware that Pharma Bro didn't get away with it, but he did actually temporarily, I, I guess they lowered it again, but, you know, temporarily, and, you know, excuse me, I've heard some, I think it was maybe Jenk on Young Turks point out, excuse me, if not for the fact that Pharma Bro stole money, you know, lost money that he had gotten from other rich people, then, you know, he wouldn't have been, you know, prosecuted at all. But, yeah, you know, he raised the price on life-saving medication, meaning that he was more concerned with making a lot of money than with helping people survive. You know, so yeah, it's not the exact same thing, and it's possible that, you know, some of the people who wrote reviews of this really don't like how leftist the movie is, and I just find it funny that just, you get that it's, like, I mean, it's, it's the kind of story that's of course going to take a very left-wing perspective, it's just, it's just, I, I don't understand why people go to the beach and then complain that there's sand. It doesn't make much sense. Like, if you wanted to be in the woods, if you prefer grass to sand, just go go to the woods. You know, it's I, I I don't know why some people need something that was made very specifically for certain people and not for them. Why they insist that it be made for them? It's just like if you want a right wing perspective in an action movie. Pick an American act like most American action movies that I know of have a right wing perspective. Can you really not handle that? There's one movie out there that's an action movie that has a left wing perspective. Like outside of like the the Bourne movies, you know there really aren't that many like devotedly left wing action movies. So I guess that's why they just they feel like that's our genre. Action movies are right wing. Not left wing, but anyway, the the yeah, a lot of people didn't like that corporations were being depicted in a negative light, and 
I realized that some of them were, some of those reviews were written years ago, and in some ways corporations behave in much more galling ways today than they did back then. But seriously, corporations have been behaving completely inhumanly, soullessly for many, many decades. You really don't. It's, I'm not sure. I think were corporations. I'm not sure. I, I don't think corporations ever were particularly humane. And maybe you don't think that they should be, but then you can't really complain that other people do think they should be. Like it's it's not a like a logic. Like again, it's like going to the beach and saying, "Where's where's the grass? I don't understand. Why is there this much sand?" That's just the way it is. Some people don't like corporations. You know, usually these people are referred to as people who don't work, you know, if you're not an executive in a corporation, I really don't, or, or like a, a politician who gets donations from corporations, I don't know why you're protecting corporations, defending them, or I, I guess I should say, you know, verbally defending them. They're not your friend. They're, they're your enemy in almost every single way. You know, corporations really need to be held more to account. I, uh, sometimes I worry that I sound way more left wing in these. That I, I am not. I'm not a communist. I am a social democrat. I think that capitalism works, but we have to have regulations because capitalists themselves, if they're not forced to abide by regulations, are going to want to do the more risky stuff so that they can make more money that way. But anyway. Yeah, so, you know, the, the, yeah, actually, I think I did say everything that the, let's see, but, but yeah, you know, I already mentioned the, the AIDS crisis in America, you know, I, I don't think that was a corporation thing, but a huge problem there was the fact that some of the, you know, most powerful people in government did not want it cured. They they were fine with it. They thought it was a good thing. You know, there's there's that. I I I'm not 100% certain if an actual right winger has said this in real life. But in the movie crap, what's it called again? I'm sorry. Um, it has Cameron Diaz, and she and other left wingers are like inviting right wingers to them so that they can poison them. And there's at least one right winger in that movie that says, and I just I don't know 100% if a right winger said this outside of fiction, but it just it really seems to me that that's what they think. He says, and I quote, "Homosexuality is the disease, AIDS is the cure." And yeah, I mean, again, just when you look at the way AIDS was handled, basically they didn't do anything until they realized. For sure, no, it's hitting straight people, too. They were fine with literally every gay person in America dying. And and the, the rest of the world as well, really. You know, it just... So, to be fair, it's not only corporations who are pure evil. I guess it's supposed to be funny that the two low techs at first don't hear Johnny and then just think that he's some random crazy person. But wouldn't it make a lot of sense for them to, you know, let Johnny in? Or maybe if there's some kind of signal, maybe Jane should know. You know, like hypothetically, maybe they could have some sort of like, if you fire a flare of a specific color. That means you're friendly or something, or maybe there's a code word to shout. But she doesn't say anything, so I guess she doesn't know any specific way, and I guess that must mean there's no specific way, because J-Bone talked to them earlier, and Spider sent them there. They came in Spider's car. So, I, I just feel like it would make... Let, let's hypothetically say that there's a specific color flare. Why wouldn't there be one in Spider's car when they're going there? It just... Oh, actually, hold on for a second. At first, I guess they were not going... Sorry, at first they took Spider's car to the, the hospital. But still, like, it just... 
It really does. He, when he sends them to Jones at the Lotex, why doesn't he say, here's how to make sure to get... Like, they almost died. He At that point, he knows that it's the cure for Nas, and he doesn't tell them. It's just so stupid. You know, and, and I think one of them even says, oh, that's Spider's car below us. Then why are you dropping a car? Oh, actually, wait, was the car dropping? Was that accidental? I really, I, I'm not going to lie. The whole car dropping thing, I think they should have dropped it from the movie. It just really, it's, it's, it just raises too many questions. I've already mentioned some of them, but some of the others include, why don't they drop a car? Once the once they're under siege at the end of the movie, what exactly do they drop cars for? Because it seems like every single time they drop one, it was unintentional. Why is the car exploding in mid-air? I, I mean, I get, okay, it hits the car, it hits Spider's car down there, then it explodes. But why did it explode? It, it wasn't on fire when they released it. I mean, do do they just excuse me? Do they hang cars up there with explosives in them? It's just I I really have no idea. And it like after a while, J Bone just lowers on a platform, and it's just like if that okay, so that's how you get in there. From so why wasn't there like some sort of the, the, like the two low tech guards, why don't they call for J Bone? He would he would recognize both Jane and Johnny on site, which also raises the question: Why didn't J Bone tell the low tech guards? Don't if you see these two, don't hurt them. They're friendly, you know. I'm not sure it really makes much sense that Johnny would be able to get his memories back at all, much less that it would happen automatically at the end of the movie when they get the data out. I mean, it would at least be one thing if his childhood memories were removed surgically and then kept somewhere that they could later get to and put it back in, but it just, the, the memories just coming back makes no sense. And also, like, it was when they removed the, yeah, when they when they got out the, the data about the, you know, the, the Nas cure, but, I mean, the, the, there wasn't data of the, yeah, haha, -ha. I, I really, I'm not gonna make jokes about, you know, a lot, a lot of people thought it was hilarious to make jokes about Keanu Reeves, you know, not having a lot of stuff in his head, and just, he's a nice guy, he's not hurting anyone, just be, it's, He's not that great of an actor. I don't I don't really get the sense that he's actually stupid. Maybe it's just that people confuse him with ah crap. Is it Bill? I, I wanna say his character is Bill and the No wait, he's Ted. I haven't watched those movies, sorry. But I don't I'm not sure I've ever like, seen him in an interview where he came across as, like, stupid? I don't know. I mean, not... I don't think he's stupid. I, I realize he's not, like, a Harvard graduate. I just... I've always figured he was somewhere in between. I, I really don't get the sense that he's stupid. And, yeah, that's all I'm going to say. I, whatever. If you want to make jokes like that, you 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 do your thing. Excuse me. But this is my video, and I'm not going to be making jokes like that. But the, the um, yeah, he didn't have data in his head at the start of the movie, and he didn't have his memory, so why would they come back when they remove the, the data that he put in his, like, it doesn't make any sense. What would make sense if they had to rush him to, like, some kind of operation or something to, to you know, like... They've been talking about how his head is going to, he's going to die soon if he doesn't get the data out. And he's having these attacks. And, and anyway. And, and J-Bone, you know, says something like, we send our, 
message we spread our message across all 500 of their channels 500 channels nothing but cats Johnny insults Jones and Jones attacks him with the satellite dish thing which I mean that's really just there to set up that Jones can use the satellite dish thing so that they later when they use that on street preacher it doesn't come out of nowhere J Bone gets Jones to leave Johnny alone but then Johnny continues to insult Jones I don't think you're right I don't think the idea is that the character is supposed to be too stupid to realize how bad of an idea this is so I, I really don't know why a too too stubborn I don't get it I really don't know why they have he he repeatedly refers to Jones as a fish which clearly Jones has an issue with because it's the that's what gets Jones to attack him I I mean to be fair if I was like if I met someone and I was like the the you know the best hope of keeping them alive and they refer to me as a fish I guess I'd be a little insulted but I don't think I would like zap them with the brain wave thingy either and I could do that so the the just yeah he he keeps calling it a fish and I I don't know maybe that's all it's supposed to be a joke isn't it it's supposed to be like haha dolphins are mammals not fish and just like hypothetically I just feel like there was a better way to, to get around that whole thing. Let's see. And Johnny slices Shinji's head off and his dead body falls. Oh, never mind. That is definitely not a dead body, dummy. I am sorry, but the ghost in the machine burning visually looks pretty silly. Does it even make sense that the third image would be the ghost in the machine? As far as I understood, all the images were ones that the defectors found on TV by changing the channel. Are we supposed to believe that she showed up on TV just in the hotel? And if so, why? All the other times she showed up, it's specifically to communicate something to someone in the room. That What would she be communicating there and on TV? I mean, I understand how she shows up on monitors via the internet, but why on TV? It just so many things in this movie that don't make sense and that's the thing like the whole thing of him seeing like his seven year seventh birthday that's and I, I'm almost 100% certain that we see enough we, we see his mother's face enough clearly enough that we can identify her as the ghost in the machine was that maybe a reshoot? Maybe Johnny wasn't supposed to get his memories back in the original script, and then the executives were, no, we got, yeah, because that would go with, I don't know, I, I could be wrong. I just feel like that goes with the kind of darker tone. I get, maybe the, is there some chance that he was supposed to die at the end of the movie originally? I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I mean, certainly that would be a, a redeeming sort of thing, you know, as it is, he doesn't really redeem himself. And, you know, I guess it's supposed to be meaningful or something that his mother is the ghost in the machine. It just... But if his mother created Pharmacom, would she really not care enough about her own son? And if she didn't, isn't it kind of depressing that she's his mother? That she wouldn't do anything to take care of him? I mean, his life is pretty risky and dangerous. And she created Pharmacom. Like, I realized that she herself was ultimately, like, they got rid of her or something. They let her die. I forget. Something. But why wouldn't... I realized that she couldn't like appeal to Johnny by saying remember when you were seven years old and you wished for that toy and you got it or something because he wouldn't remember but it does seem like if she knows does she I mean she has all her memories right or wait did she did she not 
wouldn't she know that she's Johnny's mother? And if so, wouldn't she appeal to him using something? Like, there's got to be something about him that's stayed the same or that she would know that was true about him as a kid or when she last saw him and is still true now. But yeah, the movie is an hour and 28 minutes long without end credits and 33 minutes with them. And that brings us to the next section, which is called waiting for the time to sync up best. Notes taken before watching. I watched Robert Longo's music videos, and I don't know, I guess I'm just too old for MTV, I don't know, but I found them pretty exhausting. Except, the the I was surprised that the, the REM, the one I love, was not exhausting to watch, but Helmet, give it... Uh, Megadeth, Peace Cells, New Order, Bizarre Love Triangle were exhausting to watch. And I'm not sh not surprised that Megadeth and New Order were exhausting to watch, but still. And, excuse me, I will say, Bizarre Love Triangle, I get the alternative vibe of that music video that the film also goes for. But yeah, other than Johnny Mnemonic, yeah, that's the, it's the only feature movie he's directed. He also directed... The short called Arena Brains. It was like 40 minutes. I think it was maybe on YouTube, but I can only, I'm only human. I watched his music videos, even though they were exhausting. I'm, I'm really, I don't think I'm going to watch anything else he's directed. Unless I'm certain that it's much less straining than this and his music videos. And he directed an episode of Tales from the Crypt, 1992, This'll Kill Ya. Now, let's see. Yeah, and Gibson, you know, he wrote this and he wrote the short story for New Rose Hotel. Yeah, it doesn't even say script, so he hasn't written anything else for, you know, and they're still trying to make Neuromancer. I, last I, or, or, um, I don't know if they still are, actually, now that I think about it, but for a while they were, and, you know, yeah, you know, but, is that from 92? It, sorry, 80, 82, some, something like that, early to mid 80s, and by 95 they still hadn't gotten there, so, yeah. Now, let's see. Guess that is basically. Hmm. Yeah, so I agree that the movie is preachy about the message. I mean, Henry Rollins literally spells part of it out for us. But anyone who says it's unrealistic that huge corporations would intentionally do something that meant they made money, even though it meant a lot of people would suffer, just look at climate change. It's literally destroying our world, making the planet impossible to continue living on for human beings, and yet the powerful, who could at the very least significantly slow down the process, refuse to change things because they can't handle the concept that they'd stop raking in money at the speed they currently are. I, I saw someone... I think it was a review of the... I haven't watched the the movie that... Uh, I want to say... I forget what it was called, but... Uh, Greta... Greta Thunberg. Uh, Greta Thunberg. If you want it that way. If, I realize not everybody can pronounce it the way it's... You know, it's a Scandinavian thing. I don't remember what it's called. Maybe I Am Greta or something. And I saw some criticize it, and I'm not going to get into whether it deserves their criticism, but I saw someone say that leftists are basically saying, 
lol, let's just stop capitalism. I guess maybe someone is, but if you look at the actual movements for change, they're not saying just stop capitalism. They're saying refocus and slow down, and that is completely possible. I really hate when people mischaracterize it like that. It's just... Excuse me. Now, let's see. But, but yeah, you know, climate change, even, you know, everyone even slightly credible on the subject points out that, you know, it, yeah, I, also, I remember years ago seeing someone who said, uh, you know, it's not actually going to destroy the planet. No, but it is going to make it uninhabitable to human life. I think the fact that people say destroy the planet is because it rolls right off the tongue instead of saying make it uninhabitable for human life. Just destroy the planet is a lot quicker to, you know, that's, that's typically what you want in like a if you're trying to inspire change, you want to boil down your message to something you can that can very quickly be understood. And by a certain definition, it is destroying the planet. You know, I mean, that's like saying, you know, let's see. Yeah, like that. that's like saying that you know, when an apple starts to rot, you know, you might say that the rot is destroying the apple, you know, because it's making it, imp you know, it's, it's no longer healthy to eat. But that doesn't mean that it's literally physically just gone, you know. Now, let's see. The movie also at points gets really sappy and sentimental, which may not bother every viewer, but it really goes against the gritty, grungy tone that it mostly is going for. I'm not saying there's something wrong with watching something that's sappy and sentimental, but imagine watching, let's say, Titanic, and then suddenly there's a heavily body-modded assassin with a thumb fiber wire. Those two tones just really don't go together, you know? Regardless of which the movie starts by favoring, the second should just not appear in the same movie. I like that first, at first Jane wants money, but then by the end of the movie she's apparently falling for Johnny, which is just way too Hollywood for cyberpunk. And it makes no sense, you know, I've seen others point out, he has been unbearable. Like, I'm not saying that he has zero positive qualities, but I'm not sure he ever shows Jane any of them. Like, he can be kind of, like, when they're together, a lot of the time he's whiny. And he's complaining about how bad things are for him personally. And she, at one point, she even says, maybe it's not just about you anymore. And it's just, why are they falling in love? It's just, yeah. I appreciate that Johnny isn't constantly running around firing a gun that would make things too easy and make him seem like less of a hacker. I saw someone point out, you know, he fires a gun for like two seconds and then throws it away. And yet on the cover, he has a gun. I... My cover doesn't have him carrying a gun, but I think I have seen the cover where he is carrying a gun, and I'm not sure my cover is the most common. It's really too bad that they didn't have something interesting to do with the the ghost AI, since it is a legitimately interesting idea, living on inside a computer, having will and a mind still like she changes the outcome of the movie with her appearances you know this is this is really incredibly interesting and they just don't do anything with it she's just a, a I guess not a deus ex machina or is she I'm not sure she quite qualifies for that but you know William Gibson's written stories has more be more morally ambiguous characters, so I guess that's what they were trying to do when they had Johnny for a while and resist saving people, if it meant that he himself would die from the let's see, let's see, from data being removed. 
but they went too far. It is incredibly messed up to not be willing to risk dying if it might save millions of lives. I guess possibly even billions. They say it's like half the planet that has Nas. It's just, I, I don't know why they thought that he would remain likable with that kind of anime. And some wonder why the Nas cure wasn't just put on the internet by the defectors since it's supposed to go out to everyone. They're trying to keep it away from a powerful corporation. If they just put it online, maybe the corporation just sues and gets it removed. But they can't do that once it's in the hands of the hackers since they're able to spread it so fast. I'm pretty sure there weren't any hackers among the scientists that Johnny met within the hotel. Again, people, let's please focus on the actual plot holes instead of just misunderstanding the movie. It really... Yes, today you could spread information really quickly via the internet, but this is... This movie it takes place in a different... I know if the movie doesn't communicate it well enough. Now, I rewatched Spoonie's FMV Hell videos on the Johnny Mnemonic game. And, yeah, you know, they're still fun. I watched Dominic Noble's video, John and Mnemonic Lost an Adaptation. He points out that it's read that an in-name only adaptation was written by the author of the original. The first he's dealt with on the show, at least. And, let's And I watched that sci-fi guy's video on Johnny Mnemonic, the Johnny Mnemonic retrospective review. And he points out, original Dolph Lundgren had more character, but they removed it because they were worried it would offend the Christian right. And it's like, why does it have to be about you? Why can't you look at that and think, ah, like the, uh, ah, crap, what's it called? The... I saw at least one other, you know, there was an online critic who said, I can't believe they're, they're showing Christians like this. Well, it's, he's not representative of every Christian. It's like the Crusades or the, I cannot believe I'm blanking on the, but yeah, like the, the witch trials and the, the Inquisition. You know, I think he specifically pointed to the Inquisition, so, yeah, it's like, you know, let's see, Christians got a victim complex, got to victim complex. I realize that's not a verb yet. Once again, I'm trying to make it happen. And, yeah, there's also the video, You've Gotta See Johnny Mnemonic, Essential Cyberpunk Movie Reviews. And, yeah, the deleted scenes has at least some of the Japanese film version scenes. And, you know, some of the most interesting stuff has already been talked about by others, but I want to brief this on, you know, she refers to the grenade as her key opener. It does open doors. You know, I find that to be a lot funnier than just acknowledging that it's a grenade, which, you know, in, in the, like I said, I watched the theatrical cut, and she just says, you know, she, she picks up things one by one, and she specifically says, grenade, and, and you know, right before pulling, you know, she says, watch this, we're in the Japanese one, when she picks it up, she says, key opener, and then, you know, instead of watch this, she says, my key opener. And, yeah, and the Johnny Mnemonic Riff You, which points out how many obviously stupid decisions Johnny makes. You know, yeah, these are all pretty good videos, and the, the trailers were fine. And, let's see, yeah, and I listened to a podcast. And, yeah, he says, the biggest problem with the movie is that it does too much and wants too little. And the thumb weapon is too smart for the movie. 
isn't used well and should have been cut. And there's a lot of stuff like that. And too many characters, Takahashi, Carl, Ikusa Spire, J Bone, AI Ghost. And he talks about how the theme there's themes of social commentary, big pharma. And yeah, there's there's too much in the film and it just boils down to a chase movie. It's too vanilla to hate, maybe remake or reboot, a la Blade Runner. And hire Keanu again, a la Harrison Ford. And Okay, so it's called Cult of Muscle. The that's one of the podcasts. And they think the Japanese businessman is talented, but miscast. Cyber Angel. Angel. Oh, the the AI ghost, I think. Terrible. And say it looks a lot like one of the music videos Robert Longo directed. Despite that Dolph Longer has played a cult leader a few times, he does not have the charisma to be a cult leader. Yeah. That's maybe true. And they call Keanu Reeves an underrated over-actor. It's funny when he yells for room service. Duh. He does a bad job playing snarky. And the movie has a lot of terrible one-liners. It was a bad movie before the ending, but the ending is terrible. There's very little good about this movie. It is lamentable. Yeah. Yeah, he is... I'm sorry. He is not good at... At, at, at least not in this. I guess maybe he got... Yeah, yeah, he got better by the... Um, Street Kings, he does well, but in this, it really doesn't work. Now, let's see. And, yeah, so the DVD has a trailer, it's pretty good. The, it has a behind, yeah, ten and a half minutes behind the scenes, where Dina Meyer says that Jane is basically the heroine from T2, plus the one from Aliens. And Gibson is ecstatic about the film being made, and... It's, I really wish that, you know, I wish he had been happy with it. He looks so happy to be, you know, and he talks about, like, it's a dream come true, and he's he's looking at the sets, and he's, like, practically passing out, and just, at, at how, it's exactly like what he wrote, and just, yeah. And director Robert Longo says it's like his artwork, he's wanted to do the movie for years. And, yeah, and there's 11 and a half minutes of interviews, and Keanu says that Johnny has no past, gave up his long-term memory for the job, they have stolen more information, and Keanu was clearly excited about doing the movie, and the ideas of the movie, why the character goes through what he goes through, and Dina Meyer was also really excited about doing the movie and playing the character, Dolph Lundgren talks about that his character helps his church by being a bounder on a mercenary, but he does actually believe in his faith. Which, you know, you see that stuff in the Japanese version, but the theatrical cut has almost none of it. And the direct, you know, Longo is very happy with Keanu playing Johnny. William Gibson was very excited to be able to do the story for real. And, yeah, and seeing in the real life environments that he's been describing in his writing for years. And there's a music video. I'm, I forget who it, who it was even the music video for. And then there is the, uh, what's it called? The short story as an audio book. 1981, that's it. I was close. 1984, 1982 were my guesses. But yeah, it's 45 and a half minutes. And let's see. Yeah, a, a lot of it is... I guess I'm... Okay, sure. Spoilers for the short story. Basically, Ralphie still betrays Johnny. Jane comes and saves Johnny from Ralphie. They go to low tech and defeat the the Yakuza hitman. I don't think he's referred to as Shinji there. But it doesn't have... Let's see. The characters that it doesn't have are... Spider, Takashi, Carl the Street Preacher, and let's see. yeah, I guess, yeah, so that's them. And, you know, the, the, the low techs are actually described as having canine teeth. Really, 
that, that, that there's an image, you know. No more spoilers for the short story, unless I warn first. Now, let's see. Oh, yeah. In the short story as well, Ralphie gets sliced, what does it say, diagonally, from shoulder to rib cage. So like the movie, but I don't remember if, it, you know, in the movie it's basically because he's slightly annoying to Shinji. I think there might be more of a reason in the short story, but I forget. And yeah, in the in the short story, this this is not a okay. Never mind. In the short story, the the you know Jones is still an intelligent dolphin, but he's addicted to drugs, and he helps Molly because Molly offers drugs. But yeah, the the teeth thing, I get why they maybe thought that would be silly in a big budget movie. And that brings us to the final section. Critic sites, MDB, and Wikipedia. And I have a lot of things noted, so I am just gonna try to quickly. Yeah, I'm just briefly gonna holy crap. It has a 12% on Rotten Tomatoes and a 31% audience score. As narratively misguided as it is woefully miscast, Johnny Mnemonic brings the 90s cyberpunk thriller to inane new worlds, er, lows. Wow. Couldn't resist it, could you? And... Okay, I am going to skim through the various now. Tell you what, I will very briefly state, obviously, most Christians are nothing like Carl the Street Preacher. I really don't think that you're supposed to take it as a representation of a regular... I mean, the in, in general, the movie shows a lot of really harsh and un like, you know, people that you wouldn't want, like, he's not the most, okay, he is perhaps the most sadistic character, but he's, you know, there are plenty of other really messed up characters in the movie. And yeah, I think it is basically like, well, what if the Spanish Inquisition had cyber technology, you know. And... Wow, I noted a lot of things. When I noted these that I might want to bring up, I did not realize that I was going to be talking for almost three whole hours in a row before getting to these. Hmm. Yeah, I guess.
Yeah, I think this is a pretty good, um, yeah, so this is a Metacritic review. They gave it 20 out of 100. Directing his first feature, artist Longo seems dazzled, like a rabbit, by sheer visual overload. And that's, yeah. And, yeah, that brings us to the stuff on IMDb. So I'm just going to get briefly read the five taglines. The future's most wanted fugitive. The ultimate hard drive. The hottest data on Earth in the coolest head in town. The danger is all in his head. A pulse-pounding cyber slam. Maybe in the 90s that sounded good. It... it That's amazing. Pulse pounding cyber slam. That's an incredible wow. Now let's see. Right, the the Wikipedia plot summary actually says that the reason that Pharmacom is on fire there at the end is the public set it on fire in response to Pharmacom withholding the cure. You know, I I have to admit, if I didn't read that, I wouldn't know either. And it's I'm. It seems like it happened within, like, I guess maybe a few minutes, not maybe not seconds, but a few minutes of receiving the cure. Do, do they not have guards to prevent people from the? It is just weird. Now let's. See. And, yeah, so, you know, the, the themes of the, the class conflict, I'm not 100% certain that they are in the Sprawl trilogy, but they are in virtual light. And that's maybe where, you know, why the, the class conflict in the movie is from, the, from that of Gibson's writing. I, I'm not 100 percent certain if he had written virtual light, or maybe it was just ideas he had. And later, he fleshed them out into that. But there's, I don't, I'm pretty sure there's no class conflict in this short story. And like I said, I, I don't remember about Sprawl. I'm sorry. I remember loving it, but it's been years. Right, and that brings us to the IMDb external reviews site and is a section of that site I tried to cover you know there, there are 110 total I copied in 51 total so the rest are dead links other languages stuff like that and let's With that sleek handsomeness and that earnest good dog look in his eyes, Reeves is an actor you actually find yourself rooting for. Harrison Ford may radiate integrity, but Reeves radiates niceness. Watch any scene from Johnny Mnemonic with the sound off, and there'd still be no question who's the good guy. It's it's true, and that's yeah, that's a really good way to yeah. Earnest good dog look. It's it's true. It, it, that's I don't know. Maybe that's what people are referring to when they say that he's stupid. But just he's just he's so likable. Just yeah. And it actually is wild to you know he has played some very like he's. He's not that likable or, or nice as anti-heroes. I forget about speed, but certainly he can really, you know, some of the time in Street Kings, he's really, really un unappealing. Molly, the cyberpunk heroine of the original story, has lost her name and her trademark mirror shade implants. As Jane Dina Meyer, she's still scrappy. 
I swear that was not a Freudian slip. She's still scrappy here, but more of a sidekick than an epic warrior babe. And yeah, very true. And the yeah, this is this is someone who used to be a big fan of Keanu, who she, she describes him. Yes, yeah, Keanu is perfect for this part, as his natural speech pattern is robotic surfer who just woke up. People are afraid of dark alleys because they're wet, filthy, weathered, and a little rapey, but the common approach to those scenarios was to just make everything shiny and light the hell out of it with neon. It's true. It's very well put. Even more than the script problems, the acting is awful. Keanu Reeves is still in his Bill and Ted, whoa do phase, and not in his Zen master phase, which the Matrix tapped into. There was at least one reviewer who said that basically the you know the reason that all the actors in the movie are you know they they cast all these actors who were not that talented was so that they wouldn't show up Keanu Reeves so that it would his performance would fit in now let's see one can only wonder if it would have been any better if the original choice for the role Val Kilmer hadn't passed on the role and that yeah that is as as Johnny Mnemonic I'm not 100% certain but I could imagine that he could do a, a better yeah I, th I think so I think he would have done that and I think it was because he got he, he got the opportunity to be in Batman forever and he was more you know that he wanted to do that more than this A disease called nerve attenuation syndrome, or NOTS, which has been killing everybody lately and which also had a long-running feud with Jay-Z. Now that's funny. And the... the Well done. Very well done. Right. The, the, I was going to say... What was I going to say? I was going to say that... One second, what was I going to say with this? Oh, right, yeah, so, some people say, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's such a tiny amount of data to carry. You know, I can carry that much data in, you know, a USB or a, a, an iPod or something. Yeah, but that's not the same as having it inside your brain, though. I really don't think it's that big of a deal that there's... Now, <clears throat> let's see.
and then yeah this is yeah so this person is talking about iced tea and starts by you know and says amazingly mr t uh mr ice yeah this this is yeah mr t let's And yeah, I also saw someone say that. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble remembering his name. I like the actor, though I have I've only seen him in this and Battle Royale. But okay, it says here Takeshi. Takeshi apparently learned his lines in English phonetically. It kind of shows, and it really, it sucks. I, I love him in Battle Royale. And in this, when they let him speak Japanese, he's great. Yeah, it's it's too bad. And this, yeah, here's a review where he suggests, you know, when Henry Rollins rants about why he will have Nas, he says, does that mean that it's that Nas is triggered by a society that bombards us with too much sensory input, or that the omnipresent machines are generating an ele electromagnetic field that plays havoc with the human nervous system? I... I agree. I, I wish that the movie answered that question because that is, excuse me, legitimately interesting. And I saw one other person, excuse me, say that, you know, the, the, ah, what's it called? Crap. That's not what it's called. Um, Yeah, one person said that you can tell that it was written at a time when people thought that your cell phone gave you brain cancer. And, yeah, that is true. The only really decent performance in the whole movie comes from Takeshi, who ironically is an extremely stoic actor and who works much of the film while speaking a foreign language. Yet, like the deceptively minimalist acting of Clint Eastwood, Takeshi manages to convey a lot with a truly Spartan change of expression. And... Yeah, the he points out that the the dolphin is very clearly latex, not real. And he points out that it's frustrating that Johnny keeps trying to get out of the potentially excuse me you know the the every time someone says i have a way to get the data out he says no that's too risky that that gets really tiring <clears throat> Now, let's 
seen. Keanu Reeves acting like he just saw the lines for the first time 30 seconds before they yelled action. Yeah, sadly true. And that was the first chunk of notes because there were so many. And for some reason, I decided to subject myself to all of them. But we're almost done. I think. The film is stacked with interesting actors, but the film forgets to do anything interesting with them. And yeah, he says Kitano, Reeves, Lundgren, Rollins, and Ice-T, and yeah, agreed. I mean, I remember Reeves being much better in Speed than here. That also wasn't that complicated of a role. Some have pointed out that, you know, The Matrix, it's, it is pretty incredible that they actually cast Reeves. And, you know, they, they had enough faith that it wouldn't, like, that, wouldn't pe that people wouldn't see, oh, Cyberpunk, oh, Keanu Reeves again, so it's going to be like John and Mnemonic, you know. But, and, and both movies, when you see Keanu, you know, the very first time you see him, he is in bed, face, you know, yeah, f facing a, a computer screen or, or something like that. And, yeah. Yeah, let's see. Johnny uses that weird whip thing to take Shinji's head off. And then there's another exploding car. What the hell? Was decapitation not enough? Was there a three exploding car minimum on this production? Why? Luckily, Street Preacher shows up to kill time in the last section of the film. It's wild. Some people are like, man, the, you know, Jones, what a cool concept. And others are like, what an absurd concept, and it really is, yeah. I mean, I personally, I, I do think that it's noteworthy. I'm, I'm sorry, but it seems like some of the people criticizing it did not realize the Navy has actually tried training dolphins and putting, like, electronic stuff, you know, as, uh, I want to say sonar or something like that, you know. So it's not like they, you know, it came out of thin air. You know, I, I guess the, the thing is that they can literally talk, like they speak English to it and it does what they ask it to, you know. It understands that, you know, rather than they have to give it very simple commands like you would expect for an, a trained animal, you know. But the, yeah, I don't know. I guess maybe it's also because I've played the. Let's just pretend that I wasn't about to say Resident Evil 2. So I can instead say what I obviously meant to say Red Alert 2. There are, as far as I recall, there are no trained dolphins in Resident Evil 2. But Red Alert 2 does have trained dolphins, so I was kind of used to the idea, you know. It, when I saw this movie, it wasn't the first time. It, it, like I said, I first watched it in 2006. By then, I played many, many hours of Red Alert 2. And yes, I do wish that Red Alert 2 had a more... had, had the, the more serious tone that, you know... At least that it was unintentionally campy. I don't mind the camp, but I don't like it when they lean into the camp intentionally. You know, but I do love 
the the first several of the Command Conquer games, including General and Zero Hour. Love Zero Hour. I've spent many hours playing it. Now let's see. Perhaps the phone could have been redeemed by its visual qualities, but it is not. Johnny Mnemonic is completely uninteresting to look at. The director does seem to have been trying to create a grim, distinct future, but he has completely failed to do so. The makeup is silly, the sets are entirely uninspired, and the special effects are even worse. The whole thing looks like an episode from a tacky science fiction television series made in the 1980s. I'm sorry, but that's very accurate. That's that's a really good way of putting it. John and Mnemonic, you can tell, wasn't meant to be an action-oriented project, as long intervals go without any real fighting. It's blatantly obvious, however, that due to the success of Speed, John and Mnemonic has been edited and turned into an action film by committee, and a very bad one of that. Indeed, the climax is almost crazy enough to make one forget how dull the rest of this is, but by then it's too little too late. Ultimately, you can tell this movie was torn apart by a committee. Here he plays Street Preacher, an assassin for hire who dresses as Jesus and does a weird combination of proselytizing and one-liners as he stabs people with his crucifix-shaped daggers. And their concept of cyberspace is sort of an animated virtual city representation of the internet that he has to travel through using VR gloves. I like the avatar he uses, a good example of using computer animation in a stylized, abstracted kind of way, instead of trying to create photorealism. And I would have to agree, the, I really, yeah, the, the design of, of cyberspace in this is good. In 2014, one of the producers of La Femme Nikita and Lost Girl announced a Johnny Mnemonic TV series that has not happened. Sounds like a good idea, though. He has to do different deliveries, or it could follow the end of the short story and he blackmails his former clients with traces of information stuck in his brain. Either way, he would work with Jones and the low takes would be in it and stuff. It could work, I think. Agreed. Now, let's see. I'm actually glad that Molly wasn't used in JM. It would have been a shame to ruin such an iconic character in this messy little film. I always thought Michelle Forbes, California, and STNG, NG, ST, so it must be like a Star Trek show. I guess it's one of the new ones. I, wait, oh, do they mean next generation? I guess, yeah, sorry. I'm used to that being TNG, not STNG. Anyway, would have been a great Molly. I agree. I Let's see, Michelle Forbes. I, wait, am I thinking of the right person? I'll just say, the, the one I think it's referring to is she plays Jackson in... One second, I'm right. I'm almost there. Mockingjay Part, The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2, she would be an excellent Molly. And yeah, here's someone who live tweeted the watching. Maybe it's just me, but having Henry Rollins wear giant nerd glasses in this film is hilarious.
Now, let's see. They could have made Johnny more like Molly. Instead, she's as insecure as Johnny, and he spends more time protecting her than she does him, which is supposed to be her job. I agree. It's it's so unsatisfying. It's so disappointing that they made her so insecure like that. It just... And now we are in the IMDb user review section, and I, hmm, let's see, oh, never mind, we already were, uh, is this it, this is it, there were 159 reviews total, I copied in and read every single one of them. I found the fact that they totally dumped Molly Millions, Jane's character, rather upsetting. She was totally kick-ass in the books, and she was turned into kind of a ditzy 80s chick for the movie. Didn't even have the hand raisers. I agree, like when she's talking to Johnny and she's like, Ah, oh, you gave up your memories, that's weird. You got parents and stuff, and this whole... If it was another character that is, okay, you know, I don't have a problem with people like that in real life or characters like that in most movies, but this is not Molly. Just, why would you, why would you change the character that much? It's just really frustrating. And let's Actors do a pretty bad job. Gina Meyer barely says anything and looks crazy. Johnny himself is played vacuously by Reeves, whether this is intentional or works on the grounds that he has no past, making him shallow, a detail borrowed from Philip K. Dick rather than the original story. But it works. Yeah. Okay, so this is this is some more comparison between the short story. Okay, yeah, so spoilers for the short story. Even the characters that were supposed to be the low techs were horribly misconstrued. The low techs were supposed to be presented as crude, toting simple guns and sporting savage canine implants. They did not possess a supercomputer to disrupt the system. They were hiding, not rebelling. Hollywood even demolished the innate moral of the short story. The theme of the original story is that of technology defeating itself in the end, despite the odds being stacked against Johnny and Molly. True, the original story isn't long enough to warrant a feature-length production, but I think the production staff look, took the term artistic lines a little too literally. You know, an example of a terrible Gibson adaptation? See if you can find the unproduced screenplay of Neuromancer online. It's pathetic. Briefly, more on the... Yeah, because the, the story ends with the, you know, Johnny and Molly 
blackmailing the people that he's transported information from. So, yeah, technology defeated itself in the end. Now, let's see. For me, what was really missing is the Molly Millions character. In Gibson's fiction, she's the perfect bodyguard slash warrior slash woman. Here, we have a pathetic bodyguard that has serious medical problems. Maybe it's just a guy thing, but Angela Bassett's character from Strange Days or Thandie Newton's performance from MI2 is more of what I have in mind when I envision Molly. 100%. Now, let's see. Right, and yeah, here someone points out the... At several points, we hear statements like, unleash the virus. Given that a virus, in the data sense, is self-replicating and designed to exploit holes in the security of systems which exist, no matter how well designed they are, the last thing any responsible IT manager would want to do is send one into the open. Using one to attack a possible intruder in the system is somewhat like trying to kill a rabbit with a nuclear missile. Yeah, and here there's someone who says, you know, yeah, I'm just gonna... But what makes it even better is that it captures wonderfully the atmosphere of the pen and paper RPG Shadowrun. I haven't played those, but from what I can tell, yeah, 100%. <laughs> Actually, completely by accident, but I did very recently rewatch Spoonie riffing the uh, what, F FMV of uh, one of the Shadow Run video games. So, yeah, you know, that one also had some stuff, and that was also very awkward handling. Where was the low-tech killing arena with the dancing floors? And most of all, where was Molly, the ice-cold assassin who's supposed to sa have saved Mr. Ultimate Hard Drive's butt? All we got was a whiny, frazzled-looking, and helpless dame in distress. Almost done. Let's see. Right, there's at least one IMDb user review that says the movie is like a live action anime. I, you know, if you if you wanna if you want more details, you know. Look it up on IMDb and and open the you know since there's only 159 does it's not gonna take as long to find it, it just, you know do a word search for live action anime, and he makes some good points. I have to admit I have not watched enough anime to to say you know if if what he says is accurate to anime it, it you know it's what he says is accurate to the movie that I can tell from reading it but. Yeah, so it's possible that it is very much like a live action anime. Yeah. I don't have a problem with anime. It's just not really for me. I've watched enough of it 
to be able to tell that it's not really for me. But I do I I love Akira. Let's see. Ultimately, the uh, what's it called? Death Note wasn't quite my kind of thing, but it was incredibly well made. And if it had been my kind of thing, I think I would have, you know. Yeah, there's there's a lot to love about it. Johnny's female partner is extremely unconvincing as a bodyguard. Her martial arts skills are non-existent. Watching her hobble awkwardly on one leg while launching a snap kick at roughly three miles per hour that launches bad guys across the room is just pathetic. And that was all of it. Three and a half hours. Okay, but I do think I covered absolutely everything. And, yeah, I really wish I could recommend this movie, like, just, but it, it's just, there's there's too many disappointing aspects of it, and it just, I really wish that they had gotten a different director, and, like, maybe if they had gone over the script with the executives before they started filming, and, like, tried to get to a, a middle ground, because one of the problems is that some of what the executives wanted, the, the footage wasn't there. So it just feels awkward. You can kind of tell what's supposed to, what, what they're going for, but they don't have the, the kind of footage that is, is actually, yeah. And yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry, Keanu. I really enjoy your performances. I really, you know, you're in a lot of my favorite movies. But I don't think this it just it wasn't a good role for Keanu Reeves, or at least at that point. I guess maybe there's a chance that if he tried to do it today, he'd pull it off. But I could if yeah, 1995, Val Kilmer instead of Keanu. Someone who's very you know, who's directed a lot of action instead of Robert Longo and talk to the executives about what they want out of it before filming. And I think it could have been a lot better then because it has some really good stuff. It has, yeah. But that is absolutely everything. So I hope you enjoyed watching. Whoops. Did I enjoy watching? I guess I enjoyed watching fine and recording, and I will catch you next time.